Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 198, Oddball Games, board games doing something different. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're going to be talking about oddball games, out of the box games doing something very different. Now to go along with that main topic, we'll be previewing Once Upon a Line, a game that actually has you scratching off the board like a lottery ticket. We also review Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, which really isn't all that unique, and follow that up with a look at some birthday gaming and first thoughts on Weather Machine. Before that though, let's stop by the front desk and check out the suggestion box. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a few comments on our Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade reviews. Now, Jay Barron says, This is my number two rated anime of all time behind Fooly Cooly, so of course, I bought this right away when it came out. It's a good game, but hard to get to the table with my group because no one else is an anime fan, and most aren't deck builder fans. It's good to see this game is getting some well-deserved love. Yes. Next up, we have Florian Sirix, who is one of the co-designers of the game, who quickly said, wow, thank you so much. And finally, we have Stephen Pulaski, who writes, great review. It is such a hidden gem. I can confirm the solo mode is very good as well. Nice. And although it has high scores, the win-lose condition is beating Vicious, which isn't easy solo. Well, thank all of you for the great comments. And as usual, we really appreciate when the actual designers of games check out our content. That's just, I don't know, it gives me a warm fuzzy. Now, what I love most about these comments is that it shows it's not just us. Other people are discovering this great game and loving it. And that is fantastic. Though I do feel sorry for Jay, who can't find people to play. I had hoped that the non-anime fans could at least overlook the theme because the gameplay is so good. But if you can't find people who like deck builders, that is a bit of a problem. Well, next up, we have a couple of comments on our RPG in a box topic from quite a few weeks ago back now. Phil Hatfield writes, I own two of the games you mentioned, Mice and Mystics and Descent 2nd Edition, and have played a number of others you mentioned. The one I own that I would suggest is Explore It, Forests of Adramon. It's a hex crawl, but definitely has character progression and a constant progression of escalating difficulty. The variety of characters you can play is amazing, and the story is rather interesting. And Jerry writes, Hey Mo, Chris and I have played several sessions of Shadows of Brimstone, and it has a lot of replayability. The between-game RPG ex expeditions and character advancement. Also, I have the Kickstarter edition of Massive Darkness, and I'm actually looking to get rid of it and Village Attacks. <laughs> it was a good source of minis, but didn't thrill me. If we ever do another con in Buffalo that you can attend, I can arrange for us to grab a game. Well, thanks both of you for your comments. Uh, starting with Phil's, I took a look at Hexplore and I was immediately intrigued. Now, what really caught my eye is the fact that the map is like a zoomed out. It's an overland map. It looks like an RPG hex crawl. So this isn't a dungeon crawler, but rather a full fantasy world you're exploring. And that is really intriguing to me. It reminds me a bit of games like Runebound from Fantasy Flight or the ever popular Mage Knight, which many people consider the best solo game ever made. So thanks for the game suggestion, Phil. I'll definitely be looking more into that one. Now, Jerry, based on the comment, I assume must be the awesome GA, GM, GA? GM Gerrymander from the Mr. Acting Mark RPG podcast. Um, Jerry, Shadows of Brimstone, I gotta say, keeps sounding better and better. The more I hear about the game, and the more people I hear praise it, the more I really want to check that one out. Uh, maybe at some point, I'll bite the bullet and pick it up. You know, maybe after I empty the pile of shame, that'll be a reward or something. After I finally play Conan, maybe that will be next on the list. And I gotta say, it was Sean was the one who was interested in Massive Darkness. And I gotta say, it doesn't sound like it was right for our Buffalo friends. Yeah, Massive Darkness 2 is already out there and rating much higher. So I wonder if they made some big advances between them and the original just doesn't hold up. 
Hey, Jerry, if you're listening, have you played part two? Have you played it? Or is that that's not Village Attacks, is it? That he's talking about getting rid of? Or is that an expansion? Uh, I think that's an expansion for okay. one, I believe. Now, for our last bit of feedback this week, since it ties in with our featured review tonight, we've got a comment from Levi Moat on our Dice Kingdoms of Valeria unboxing that went live earlier this week. Thanks for the video and the kind words. Well, thank you for yet another great game, Levi. I have a feeling that if you like the unboxing, you're going to love the review later. Well, that's it for this week's comments. We always love it when you comment on our posts, email mo at tabletopbellhop.com or reach out on social media. One quick announcement before we move on to the meat of the show. So right now, tonight, we are recording episode 198. We are live recording 198 which means we are only two episodes away from an arbitrary number milestone. Bring on episode 200. Since celebrating such things is both expected and, I gotta say, quite fun, I wanted to get the word out now and encourage you to join us and help celebrate this momentous, arbitrary occasion. Assuming nothing terrible happens between now and then, we should be recording episode 200 on February 1st, right here at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, Going live at 9 p.m. Eastern. Now, for that episode, one of the things I think we'll do is revisit. Uh, well, I'll revisit my top 25 games of all time. It's been since our first year since we've done this one. Uh, many, many episodes ago. And I got to say, I know the list has changed. Just looking at my list in that episode, I'm like, no, 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 that wouldn't be there. Like, for example, Azul. I'd still like Azul, but I don't think it's top 25 anymore. We were just a little smitten with it at the time. Um, plus I, I'll probably call it top games of right now, because if I go through pub meeples board game ranking engine this week and then do it next week, it'll probably change because my preferences change. But what I'd like to do this one to make it a little special now that Sean has, will have 199 episodes of gaming under his belt, as well as some special episodes. So more than 200 episodes, it'd be awesome if you did a 25 as well. Indeed. Thankfully, BG stats can come to the rescue for me. If nothing else, <laughs> there you go. Now, along with that is our main topic. I'm sure we'll spend some time interacting with those of you able to join live in the chat room in our lobby. We'll talk about the games we get played between now and then and all the usual stuff you have in our shows. But we'll probably be skipping the review segment. You can also expect some special celebration events like giveaways, door prizes, maybe some bellhop trivia and more. Now, heck, I'll spoil one of them right now. We've already been contacted by the awesome Mark Spector of Grand Gamers Guild after he listened to our top games of 2020 and went, wow, you mentioned a lot of my games, decided to celebrate with us and is offering up two of his games for us to give away. And for any other publishers listening to this who happen to catch it, if you want to help us celebrate, just reach out. Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Hope to see you in the chat on the first. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we've got a question from one of our long-term fans and Patreon patrons, Roger Malosh of Roger Dodger Games. Roger writes, Hey, Mo and Sean. Hearing or watching your show has become part of my weekly routine, and I look forward to it every week. Well, thanks for that, Roger. He recently acquired a game called Shamans, or Shamans. It's a kind of sort of semi-cooperative game with trick-taking, deduction, and hidden roles. Oh. It's based in the world of ancient shamans. It seemed to be way outside the box, so I had to have it because I'm attracted to very unique games. I love games with unique mechanics and gameplays like Seven, Quad Heroes, Pit, and First Contact. I also like a really unique theme, like in the game Processing, where you're voting to send humans or cows to the alien food processors, <laughs> or Euphoria, where you're controlling your own dystopia, Art and all that fluff doesn't usually matter much to me, but I did buy one game based mostly on its looks. The artwork in the game, Imaginarium, looks like Escher and Magritte had a baby in steampunk land. I instantly added this game to my collection. Now, what games would you consider really outside the box? Do you know of any that have gone too far and are too weird to be fun? Well, thanks for the detailed question there, Roger, and of course, for being one of our patrons and for being a fan of the show for as long as we've been on the air, almost 200 episodes worth. 
Now, for this list, what I decided to do is stick to games that I've actually played, most of which I still own and still enjoy. Though I did some research and added a couple of others that we may not have actually played. Fair enough. So the first game that popped into my head when thinking about this was actually further down the list. But the second game that came into my head was Zolkin. Because of one aspect of the game that is so difficult to quantify because there's nothing that's in the rulebook. And that is that your own patience is a resource in that game. In that game, you are putting pieces out on a gear and that gear is going to turn and your guy's going to move along on the gear and eventually you're going to take it off and get what spot it's on. And the whole game's about either putting new people out or taking them off in order to go up tracks and get points and it's a point salad at that point. But it's the fact that the longer you can leave your people out, the better thing you tend to get. And it really does get tempting to pull your pieces off to feel like you're doing something. And I don't know how to quantify that because, like I said, it's not in the rule book. It's not like part of the game. It's not a mechanic. But the fact that your own patience can get the better of you when playing Zolkin, to me, makes it really stand out. Absolutely. Uh, so the next one was one I found, uh, which is a really interesting concept, and that is Shadows in the Forest. Now, this is an intriguing game where you are playing with uh, one versus many in a forest. Uh, the forest is made out of wooden, uh, you know, pieces of wood, you know, pieces of wood in the shape of trees and mm -hmm. that are just standing up. Yeah, yeah, just doing the interlock. And uh, one player is a light. Uh, in the original versions, it was a candle. Uh, yep. In the new versions, it's an LED lantern. Uh, and whereas the other players are trying to hide from the light and are frozen when in the light, uh, but able to move around. And once all the players are able to hide from the source of light in the shadows, they win. Otherwise, the light wins. Yeah, I think this one's a fascinating one. I think I played it a long time ago. This one's been around for a number of years. This oh, is no. not a new game. No, no, not at all. But there are so few games out there that use actual light. Mm -hmm. Like I personally have played one and it was part of an escape room game. And I do have to say, I don't like the new version as much as a lighting yeah. guy. The new version with the lantern has a really diffused light. Yeah. So the shadows aren't crisp when you've got the candle in there, which I fully admit is a dangerous and not recommended practice. <laughs> you get the sharp edges of shadows yeah. where it meets the trees. And unfortunately, the, the light from the new LED is just really diffused and doesn't give you the same effect. You just need a brighter LED somehow. I'm sure there are people out there who have DIY <laughs> shadow in the forest to make it better. I think there's some themed versions of this as well. So I think I remember one with little raccoons trying to hide. Okay. All right. The actual first game I thought of when I read Roger's question was Go Cuckoo which maybe I should have grabbed, grouped with some other ones, but this one is just everything about this is unique. Starting from the fact that someone at Haba said, let's put out a board game for Easter and we're going to make an Easter themed games for people. And we're going to make it a limited release at the time. So that like you had to get it in time for Easter. Then you take the fact that it's a dexterity game where you're basically playing reverse pickup sticks. You have a bunch of wooden sticks in a can and you're pulling them out and building a bird's nest. And then there's something that we mentioned last week, or was it two weeks ago? I don't even remember now. When we were talking about end game triggers, where not only do you have to place all your eggs to actually win the game, you have to put this big chunky cuckoo meeple on top of everything without it all falling apart. And like that just adds so many different unique elements. And honestly, except for the slight resemblance to pickup sticks, there really isn't anything else in common with any other games out there. No, absolutely. Go cuckoo uh, stands on its own. Uh, next up, I found another one called Cur uh, Pyramid of the Penguin. That's Penguin Queen, essentially, uh, mashed together. It's also known as Curse of the Mummy. Now, we've talked in the past about uh, the mysterious, uh, sorry, what's the name of the um, magical labyrinth? Magical labyrinth. This is similar, except it's actually played on a vertical board where you have a one versus many again, a mummy or a, you know, the penguin queen on one side and a bunch of other travelers, adventurers on the other side. Now, the interesting thing here is the, the reason for this vertical board is it's using magnets. Now, the mummy or penguin actually can't see the adventurers, whereas mm -hmm. the adventurers can see the mummy or penguin. Oh, interesting. 
So the mummy is moving around and they know where it is, but they have limited movement due to dice rolling and such like that. So the, the mummy has to move around and try and take out the adventurers while the adventurers know where they are, but can't always necessarily get away. Interesting. So it's a, it's an interesting twist on hidden movement and, uh, and, and using the magnets in that, in that manner. Yeah, there are some really neat magnet games out there. And that may remember there's another one that didn't make my list because I've never played it. But you each build two sides of a map and you can't see the other side and it's get through the maze with a marble and it's okay. face up. That also kind of like that, but nothing with the, the one versus many. I got to say that's one versus many done right without any silly tracking things on <laughs> paper or deck of cards to show where you've been. Yep. Sounds great. My next one is Niagara. Um, it's not unusual nowadays to find games that use the box as part of the game. Um, I could have put Cleopatra Society of Architects on this list, for example, or uh, more recently, um, the Mont uh, Mountains on a Molehills also use the box. But this one uses the box in a really unique way in that the box, all it does is holds up the board. And then you put this two layer board over both box tops and have it fall off the edge. And you literally have like the waterfall of Niagara falling off the edge. But then there's a track on these boards that's like a um, a ravine. I'm thinking I'm tr I'm totally grabbing the wrong word here. But there's there's like inset area, and you put these plastic discs on them, and then you have little canoes, and you put them out on the discs, and you have you're gonna grab meeple, you're gonna grab um rubies and gems from various different spots along it. But the whole thing is at the end of every turn, you slide a blank disc on the end, and all of the canoes slide down the Niagara River. And the neat part here, too, is that there's a, a fork. And in general, most of the time, because of the odds and physics, it's going to split. It's going to go left, then it's going to go right. It's going to go left, it's going to go right. It's going to go left, and it's going to go right. And you can kind of plan ahead. But every now and then, it doesn't quite behave the way you expect. And I got to say, there's pretty much nothing more satisfying than playing properly and pushing one of your opponent's canoes over the edge of the falls. <laughs> so, like, a bunch of neat unique things going on in that game and really solid game it's one of those games where everyone gets the same hand of cards at the beginning to take their moves and once they're out you get all your hand back so you can kind of predict what other people are going to do and did he use his nine yet really neat game interesting and that was niagara and next up uh we have hamster roll which is very unique and with that we're sort of rolling in a lot of other dexterity type schemes because in many ways Almost every dexterity game is, in its own way, a unique yeah. uh, sort of concept. So games like Pitch Car, Ice Cool, Flick 'em Up, Tick Tock oh. Woodsman, um, the Fleet Flick Fleet, uh, and all these other dex games all have something unique about them. Generally, uh, unless you're looking, you know, Pitch Car or the and and the six hundred other parts of Pitch Car. Yeah, but. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, but Hamster Roll especially is one of those really unique ones because of the way, not only how it stands out, but the fact that they uh, st stand by the fact that every one is handmade. Mm -hmm. It's not perfectly stamped out in, in, in uh, so that they're all the same, every box you get. It is a handmade, unique game every time you buy it. Yeah, that's my favorite part. I think that's why Hamster Roll belongs on this list a little more than the others is the fact that like everyone's wheel is going to roll differently and all the slats might be at slightly different angles and it, everyone's wheel is unique. And I love that. But there are so many unique deck schemes. Like you got games where you're trying to stack things on pandas and you got games where you're trying to not have a Yeti fall into your bowl of spaghetti. And like, like we can make an entire list of unique dexterity games and it'd be like every one, like yeah. so you got ice cool where you're flicking penguins around that you can make jump over walls just like like just dexterity games of their own could be this whole list. Yep. Next up, I have Ghost Blitz and uh, Toyetic. Very cool looking game where you have a th I, I might get that it's been a long time since I played this one because it's a, it's very much a kids game, but it's one I kind of wish I owned because I think we'd play it out at certain nights like my birthday party on the weekend. It would have been a good one. I think it's five different objects that are in five different colors. And what happens is you shuffle a deck of cards and you flip it up. And you have to grab the unique item that doesn't match anything on the card. So it can't be the same color and it can't be the same object. And it'll be like a picture of a ghost holding a the 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 like wine bottle sitting in the chair and uh, the books on the floor. And you've got to figure out what's not showing. And you're like, oh, it's the mouse. There's no mouse in this picture. And you have to 
first person to grab the most wins that card and you play till you've grabbed enough cards and it's just such like the unique cool pieces um i don't even know the publisher i think it might be zock but it's one of those german wooden wood toy companies that put out this board game so you have these fantastic wood pieces that are designed for kids so there's no like spiky bits or anything and you're literally physically having to grab a piece and i guess that part's kind of dexterity but it's really about doing the deduction and then every now and then there'll be the actual item that's on the table and it'll be perfect. And you're supposed to then grab the item. So you can't even just fall into the trick of always looking for the thing that's different. Sometimes it's like, oh, wait, it's the white ghost because the ghost's white and you have to grab that one. Surprisingly, there's a really good app version of this, which I've actually played more than the physical copy. And that's what my kids used to play at restaurants when I was trying to calm them down when they were younger. Is I, It was on Apple, at least. I don't know if it's on Android. And all that is the card comes up and you tap on the appropriate thing and you have a timer that counts down. Uh, there is also a Ghost Blitz 2, which mm -hmm, can be played new. on its own or used to expand the original. Uh, now, next up, I have Hanabi. This is one we've talked about a number of times and I've played uh, oh, any number of times on uh, Board Game Arena. But this is one of the first uh, card games where cards are facing the other opponents. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not something like the headbands game where you've got one card in there. Yeah, yeah, that, but this is, this the, is this your is... whole hand is facing the other players and not you. You have no idea what's in your hand, but you know what's in everybody else's mm -hmm. hands. Uh, and the communication or lack thereof uh, that comes from that and the, and the trying to, you know, hope everyone manages to get to play. and But knowing that someone's about to make a horrible mistake and not being able to say anything yes, about it. You're like, oh. uh, the limited communication where, you know, say giving, giving some information to the players is, is really unique. Uh, and as far as we know, I think, uh, you know, Hanabi was the first to really, yeah, really do this one. As far as I know, I, I do own a couple games that went on since, but none of them were as good as Hanabi either. Like they did some neat things with backs of cards, but nothing quite. Yeah, like there's there's seven 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 and and a couple of other things like that, but they they aren't the same. There's uh, resistor, which I have right here. This uses it. The opponent player opponent player can see the other side of your cards and use them, tell you to flip them and stuff. But that's more of a memory game. So it's one of those once a card's out, it's like your action can be flip that one because you know what's on the other side. But it just none of them really took off like Kanabi. Yep. All right, next I have Town Center. Um. I don't even know how to describe this game. So you have a board and you have a bunch of cubes and the cubes represent different types of districts in a growing like metropolis, like your town center. And the game itself seems pretty easy where you're like, you, you pull cubes out of a bag and you're drafting. And you're like, I got a blue, I got a this. And the whole thing about this is that there's this entire system called organic growth. And I am not going to be able to repeat the rules here because this is actually a fairly heavy game that is very thinky. And what it is, it's like, if there are enough residential buildings, or sorry, if there are enough commercial buildings for people to work, the residential buildings near them will grow. And it's called organic growth because you have no control over it and you can't stop it. And some bad things can happen where if things can't grow up, they start sprawling out and your town being sprawling is bad and negative points for everything on the outskirts. And this is a game that not only needs like drafting logic, um, strategy but also spatial thinking and that alone just blows people away and this is a game i love and many other people i've taught it to absolutely hate and never want to play again because it just they didn't like the way it felt and the way it made them think and they're like that was not fun that was like like work and trying to figure out a logic puzzle that you're stuck on with no hints so to me it's just that organic growth system combined with what looks like you know a dexterity game really a stacking game yeah, it's it's almost um, uh, I want to say like uh, a tower game meets Sim City meets um, uh, suburbia. It you know it's got yeah. it's got that high level of complexity and 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 things triggering off of other things, but it's also just little wooden cubes. Uh, yeah. It's a really it's a really interesting one. It, it is. It's it's very bizarre and another one that, that didn't quite make our list, I guess, because I don't see it here. Maybe we'll toss it in is uh, The Climbers. It reminds me a bit of The Climbers, but like it's not The Climber because yeah, it's, it's you're spending, you're even getting money and you have to pay taxes and you have to buy these cubes and to place them costs money. And the amount of connected commercial blocks that are close enough to a residential block is what pays you at the end of the turn. Like this is not a light game, despite what it looks like. Well, next up, we have one we just reviewed recently, and that's 
drop it. Mm -hmm. Connect four that isn't an already solved math problem. <laughs> it's 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 similar to connect four in some ways, whereas you're dropping things down. But unlike just trying to a simple match, you're dealing with a lot of different interacting problems of colors and shapes that can't interact with mm -hmm. each other. Uh, and those negative interactions are really what makes the game on top of the quirky little physics problems of what shapes drop in what ways and land and bounce and and whatnot. Uh, so that becomes, you know, drop it becomes what looks like a simple kids game until the first time you sit down and figure out how you're going to get that piece to where you want it to be. Yep. Now, what I also love about that one is the ability, once you know the game, to plan ahead and play cutthroat, where you can look at what your opponent has over there, and you're like, well, if I drop this here, I might not get anything, but there's no way they're getting anything either, and I think that's what really brings it to the next level. Next up, I think this, out of everything we mentioned so far, may top the list for weird, out-of-the-box, strange games. Uh, Go Cuckoo's up there, too, but Ugtech. You are playing like the theme. You are playing cavemen architects trying. You're like the master architect trying to convince other cavemen to build structures the way you want them built. And you have to do this through two different things. One is a language based on grunts and the other is interpretive dance. So you like indicate the piece by whatever a gunga and you indicate how they want to move it by like wiggling your hips. And then when they get it wrong, you have a foam, not foam, sorry, a blow up. Um, I, I forget what it says on it. You have a blow up club with a spike on it, which is also blow up that you hit them with to tell them they're getting it wrong. You cannot touch the pieces. You are trying to get the other people to do it. And no caveman poetry did not do the bop people with the thing when they're wrong thing first. It comes from Ugg Tech. Oh, there we go. This is one we should have played on my birthday, but I didn't <laughs> think of. I think Tori would love Ugg Tech. Right. Well, next up, we've got one that I recently finally played for my first time, and that is Super Motherload. This is a game where you're playing uh, people on Mars trying to uh, explore and develop Mars for its resources. Uh, it's a deck builder, but it's got a really interesting descending game board mechanic where you're slowly working your way down deeper into the planet to gain those resources. Uh, delving below and drilling down and using explosives to try and gain things which will get you more coin uh, coins, which will get you more cards, which will get you more abilities. Uh, yeah, and the, the vertical, you know, the vertical scroller concept uh, in a in a board game is really mm -hmm. what this game does well. Yeah, people like to call it Dig Dug the board game, and for pretty good reason. There's no monsters to fight, but you definitely kind of get that digging feel. Uh, there's a few things in this that make it stick out too, like that whole system where you have to take the crystals you find to put onto your different crew types to train your crew mm -hmm. is actually really well done. Like that's one of the neatest get new cards in your deck mechanics I've ever seen. Next one for me, I don't actually have the original version, which I don't know if you can see it behind me, uh, but survive escape from Atlantis. I actually have the sci-fi version, which all it does is change one thing where some of the tiles have special abilities on the bottom. This is a game that destroys itself as you play it. You start the game with this giant island and all kinds of meeples all over it, representing the different players, and there's some lifeboats on the outside, and then all of a sudden, a horrible catastrophe happens, and every turn, you're going to be removing pieces from the island. The goal of the game is to get as many as your meeple to the outer islands to survive, but at the same time, when you're moving your pieces, you can also move the various sea monsters and sharks and other things, especially if you have the expansions, the ton of expansions for this game. And then there is a ton of take that where you can share boats or not share boats and capsize boats. And then there's even a neat mechanic where your meeples are worth different points. So you're like trying to save your three, but you're not as worried about your ones, but you don't want your opponents to know which one's your three because we keep moving the one. They're going to be like, oh, that's his three. We got to go get that one. Just such a unique game that has been around since I think it's the 60s, maybe even be 50s. Still in production today. They just keep cutting out prettier, neater versions. Yeah, it actually started off as Escape from Atlantis and then became Survive Escape from Atlantis uh, a little later uh, when, they, when they sort of upgraded it. Uh, and it's got some fantastic stuff. And again, so much content as well as the sci-fi version yep. uh, of it as well. Uh, so much going on there. 
Uh, next up, we've got one that we're going to be reviewing a little later tonight, and that is Once Upon a Line. Now, this game is a word find meets scratch lottery ticket campaign game. And if that interests you, maybe you should stick around for our review later and see what we thought about this strange game with a unique playing concept. Now, I will call it out just for those of you only watching this segment on YouTube so you're not listening to the full podcast. This is a very unique one that definitely is different from anything else I've ever played. You are trying to find words. Words have you look at cards. Cards have you give you more words to find and eventually get through a story. It's it's definitely it inspired this show tonight, to be honest. Next up, OK, this is the one I said, not all the games on here I still own and not all are still I still play, but I had to put it on here because this is from Twilight Creations. It is a hobby board game but it features wind up zombies. You are playing wind up zombies. You play cards to show how many times you twist your winding thing. You put your zombie down, you aim it at other zombies and you try to knock the other zombies down. I like, come on. How can that not make this list? Like I've owned it. I, I owned it. I played it. I eventually got rid of it because it was just kind of silly. And one of the zombies always curved to the left, which kind of ruined it. They, they kind of all need to watch straight to do it. And yeah, you could kind of pivot, but that kind of ruined it for me. But talk about unique, like like for a hobby board game, it sounds like something you'd find at Toys R Us or something <laughs> and you play silly. But of course, it had some game mechanics like there was card play and everyone had the same decks and you had to pick. Are you going to wind three times or is he going to wind two? Oh, he's winding two. Is he going to go far enough or is he going to stop over there? Silly game. There we go. That was all wound up. Uh, so next up, I've got Doodle Quest. Now, this is a game where you flip up a board and then the players draw on an acetone sheet uh, and then put their sheets over top of that board to see how well they scored. Uh, sometimes you're trying to circle things. Other times you're trying to draw a path, navigating a maze or drawing something without touching other things. Uh, there's actually another version of this game, mm -hmm. a Looney Quest, I think it's called. Yep. Um, that's uh, the same same idea with a different theme, and they've, they they just want a different direction with the concept. But again, you're drawing on these acetone sheets uh, without knowing exactly where all the bits and pieces you need to dodge are going to be when you flip the board over and put your sheet back down on top of it. Yeah, this one's a neat one. My kids love this game. We would still have a copy, but they got it when they were very young and it didn't survive. <laughs> one of the cool things it is it actually had templates. So like one of the things would be draw three fish, but there's like fishing lines everywhere on the board and you have to draw them so they don't get caught. And it actually came with like a template for drawing fish. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Everyone gets their templates. I did enjoy that one. I did not check out the follow up. Now, I will call out another game that uses acetone sheets, and that is Wildlands, but in a very different way. Yeah, that was another one with my kids where you're instead you're trying to build the path and the acetone sheets in the middle. And then you put the sheet over your board. So it's kind of like reverse doodle quest without drawing. Next, I have a true classic, which I don't know if people can see it in the background, but if they can, it's probably making them jealous. And that is Dark Tower, the original app game, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> there weren't smartphones back there, but you had a giant electric tower with a light bulb in the bottom of it and took the D-sized D-cell batteries in the bottom of it that spun around and played horrible, tinny, I, I don't even know what you call that kind of sound effects, electronic sound effects as you tried to move around a board and build up your hero so that you could challenge the dark tower. Um, other neat things people forget is like the tower turned, So it faced towards whoever turn it was. Um, it had miniatures, which were pretty rare nowadays. And it had one of the best board designs I've ever seen where the board was modular. You couldn't change it up. It was like multi-part board, but it had plastic buildings you would snap in. And while some of those buildings went over the gap between regions. So the buildings actually held the board together. It had a pegboard for tracking your health that used like the battleship pegs. There was just so much amazing stuff and innovation in that game. And that was Dark Tower, recently re-released by Restoration Games. So from what I hear, a very different game, though similar, at least in feel. And next, we have a game, or maybe not, depending on your particular opinion. We have The Mind. Now, this is a simple game where you're just putting down uh, car putting down cards in descending order. But you can't talk. 
And you can, not only you can't talk, you can't, talk, you can't, you can't indicate, you can't have any form of communication yes. whatsoever. Uh, and, and that leads to uh, all sorts of uh, fun and interesting things. But again, uh, everyone will have an opinion on whether or not this is a game or an activity. Uh, it is, no matter what, though, certainly unique. Yes, so the, that this one took the gaming industry by storm, uh, first by selling out, and then by people complaining about how it's not a game. I don't know if they're just jealous they couldn't get a copy because it sold out. I've got it. I enjoy it with the right group, but the whole thing with this is is the actual rule is zero communication, and that's, like, impossible. The only way to play with zero communication is to play on Board Game Arena. Like, yeah. which then, how do you actually win? There has to be some, right? And every group has their own health rules for it. I don't know. I, if nothing else, it wins an award for being the, one of the most debated games of all time. Yep. Next, I have Time Stories. This is a really unique one um, where I, it's this one's hard to describe. You start off by taking a deck of cards and building a panorama. Then you read a bunch of cards. You then dive through the machine where you flip up new cards, which changes the panorama. And that's literally what your characters can see. So there's a unique thing there using a deck of cards to build a panorama where you're looking for clues and stuff. Then you're inhabiting a person from that time period, quantum leap style. And then you're trying to solve some kind of mystery or murder or something. Um, also super dark and twisted. The first game that you get in the box, you are inhabiting people in an insane asylum. And criminals, criminally insane. And like you're playing murderers and stuff. And then you're going through the game trying to figure things out. And there's dice-based combat and you're trying to solve it. But then you screw up. Well, that's okay because it's called time stories. Reset the pattern. You're back in the lab. You can see your pods. The The big, ba ba big boss is mad at you and yelling at you. Dude's a total jerk. And then you go try again. And you go back and you flip the cards and you try to figure out what you did wrong. And it has some of that, um, what would you call it? The, 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 um, the video game everyone plays, Dark Souls, where you're like, you walk, or, or I've been playing Odd World, where like, there's certain things you're not going to be able to stop. You just like happen to go in the spot and this person commits suicide. And you're like, wow, okay, don't go in that room. <laughs> and that's your whole trick is don't go into that room because the orderlies go and save the person, for example. And I'm kind of making that up because I don't want to spoil anything. And then once you finished it, you exit it out and you can then go buy another pack. And the next one was set in the 80s. It's called like Estrella Drive. And then another one, you're actually in a fantasy world, which I had no clue they were going to that angle. So not only are you going back in time, you're also going to fantasy worlds. Fantastically unique game. We really enjoyed the first part. But then we started hearing rumors about just how bad the ending is. And that kind of turned me off on playing the rest of the story. Mm, unfortunate. So next up, I've got Nyctophobia. We've talked about this in the past, but this is a one versus many game. Uh, depending on which version you've got, you're either playing vampire, uh, being hunted by a vampire or being hunted by a mage or axe murderer. Mm. The trick to this game, what makes this game truly unique, is that the players who are hunted, the many in the one versus many, cannot see. It's oh. a cooperative blind game where the hunter can see the board but the hunted need to feel around and 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 feel the board in order to try and determine where to move and how to escape from the hunter yeah. uh, and there aren't too many games where losing sight is the key mecha mechanism of the game yeah. i don't know if there's any others now, the part I love the most about this is it was created by someone to play with a blind relative. I don't remember the details at this point, but they wanted to make a game specifically to enable, daughter. Yeah, enable the blind to to have an advantage even over sighted players. And I'm like, that's fascinating on its own. Yeah, absolutely. Next up, um, this isn't as unique now, but I'm, I'm going to give it credit as the game that did it first, kind of the same way we did. Um, uh, it's a Hanabi. card game, Hanabi, yeah, like Hanabi. And that is Rattlebones. This is a game from Rio Grande Games. No one's heard of, no one's played, it seems like. But you wouldn't have Dice Forge, or you wouldn't have one of the expansions for Roll for the Galaxy, and you wouldn't have 
what's the massive one that just came out? Dice Realms with like 3,000 pieces on it. None of those games would exist without Rattle Bones because at the time, Rio Grande patented in trademark plastic dice where you can swap off the sides. This game is amazing, and I, I, I want it. It's on my wish list. I need to find a copy of this, but it's long out of print, and you can't get it. But you are performers in a circus, and you're going around a board like a rondelle, and every spot you stop on, you can modify your dice. And you start off with one die, and then eventually you can get up to three dice, and you're lapping around, and you're getting points for stopping at different spots and enabling the monkeys and whatever. It's just kind of a silly, fun game, but with that really cool mechanic of every time you stop at a spot, you can change one of the sides on one of your three dice. Really well done. And then you get into Dice Forge, where it's more of a Euro game and a kind of deck builder card game where you can swap out your dice. And then, again, the Realms one looks amazing to me, but it's MSRP of like $180. I haven't picked up Rattlebones. I can go get Rattlebones for that much. I'm like, no, that's that's okay. I don't need to spend that much on a game. Rio Grande, if you're listening, though, I'll totally review it. <laughs> <laughs> well, next up, we've got uh, another sort of class of games. There aren't too many. Uh, but the first of them was really Captain Sonar. And this is the real-time individual mini games uh, sort of a game where everyone is playing their own little game towards a common goal. Uh, in the case of Captain Sonar, obviously, it's, it's commanding a submarine. There are a couple of different space adventure ones, mm -hmm. uh, you know, playing deck, deck, deck members like you would on this on the in Star Trek. And games like that, but it's that it's that real time mini games all trying to work towards a common goal. Yep. That's the interesting and unique mechanic in Captain Sonar and similar games. Whereas Captain Sonar is LARP Battleship. That is is pretty much what that is. <laughs> you are playing Hunt for Red October. You have you you literally are guessing numbers on grids and mapping things out and where people move. It's if you want a, a gamer's version of Battleship, Captain Sonar is the way to go. Um, Space Cadets is the the one Star Trek game that's out there with its own mini games. And then I think there's now The Captain is Dead is another more modern one. Um, we even reviewed one forever ago. Disaster Looms when you were on a spaceship. There are quite a few of these out there. I want to end up adding to the list last minute, um, which I can't believe it took me a bit to think of because we were kind of joking about it on the weekend, is Rail Pass. This is a pickup and deliver train game where you physically pick up and hand a train loaded with cargo cubes to the other players. It's a cooperative game where the cubes are all mixed up at the beginning of the game and you are trying to deliver them to the appropriately colored city um, in a set time limit really good game like i i was shocked by how fun it was i just this is one that i did do get a review copy of and you can check out our review for more details but i actually like wrote two mercury games and was like i need to try this because come on it's a pick up and deliver game where you actually pick up and deliver something yeah, i just the, love the entire concept the physical translation of the the conceptual mechanism is just so so brilliant yes. here it was it's amazing that it took as long as it did for someone to actually give you a pick up and deliver game that you pick up and deliver in. Yes. And, and unlike like, you know, trader mechanic, the trader mechanic game, there's like a physical thing happening here. It's not just like a play yeah. on words using the theme. Yeah, it's not point salad, the point salad game. It's, it's, yes, it's a real exactly. physical action. Well, next we have three honorable mentions games that made the list, but then we realized it's not actually the game. That's all that unique, but rather the theme. Yeah, so Roger did call out a bunch of games where it was a theme that was unique, but there are a ton of them. I wanted to call out these ones in particular just because they're, they're, they're ones that I enjoy or I think are really neat. And the first one is Dead Man's Cabal. This is a game where you are playing lonely necromancers who are invited to a dance party, don't have any friends, so you raise the dead so you can show up with your, um, I, what's the word, your, your, your group. Your, there's a TV show called it, the, the, your famous person and they follow you around paparazzi no that's not it whatever your group cabal well cabal. yeah <laughs> cabal that's not the word i was looking for though that's all right 
Posse. There's one that's still not. I don't think that was quite the word I was looking for. Entourage. There we go. Entourage. There. Thank you, Darkling Blade. Wow. You, you can tell <laughs> when our notes aren't that scripted because I'm like, what is the name of the people who follow you? To And specifically, this entourage tends to be very famous people and actors. Though they don't call that out in the game. But if you look at that card art, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Um, added to the theme, there are some neat mechanics here. I almost had it on the top list because there's this whole thing where you're pulling different colored skulls out of a bag and then putting them on this track where you bump everything down. And then it's the ones in the middle that get activated. And then there's a whole thing where you have a pentacle where you're putting down skulls in the right pattern and you use them up to summon the dead. And just and, and here, here is something why it should have been on the top. It is a game board that is completely modular where you build a dungeon. And it includes corridors to put between the various game pieces to make it look more like a dungeon. No other game does that because that is totally superfluous and absolutely useless. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, next up, we've got Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. Now, this is a really interesting game where two to four players cooperatively are working with someone at the end of their life. Uh, Billy Kerr has had a heart attack on a uh, airline flight and is now in the hospital on his, his last days. And you're trying to learn about the life of Billy Kerr uh, and slowly care for and also learn from the patient uh, as you play through the game. Yeah, totally unique theme. Seems heavy. I don't know. I, 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 I would never buy this, but I would totally if someone had a copy, I would give it a shot. On the right night, not my birthday when I'm pounding beers. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a mood where you do and don't want to play this. Yeah, I, I am so curious about this one. Yeah. Uh, the other one I wanted to call out was Millennium Blades for a couple reasons. One, I almost put it on the list. Two, it's on like everyone else's check out what weird game, what are unique game mechanics. And the whole thing about Millennium Blades is it's a card game, a deck building card game, but it's about collectible card games but you don't actually collect cards and it's not even about playing an individual collectible card game, but rather being in a collectible card game tournament and the meta that goes with it. And I'm like, man, that is fascinating. And they did some really amusing stuff to kind of make fun of the collectible card game industry. Like your money in this game are wads of cash and you will be throwing wads of cash into the bank to pick up card packs but the card packs, when you actually go to play, are only one card because that's the only good card that came out of that pack, which is another statement on collectible card games. And then you're going to build a deck out of your cards. But then when they come up, it's more of a deck builder and they happen in a set order. And then you actually play out a tournament where each card just represents your big play, that particular game of the tournament. And again, it's affected by the meta. So if the meta right now is green, if you play cards that are green, you're going to get more points for the tournament. It's just a, a Sean needs to play this. But the problem is it's actually a fairly heavy, really detailed strategic game. Like it's up there in weight. And now you kind of want it to be fast, furious, fun, and it's not. And it's just a game where, unfortunately, I don't play it often enough. And I would have to totally relearn from the beginning how to play it again. Fair. So I think we're going to stop here because unique themes is just way too easy. There are so many games with unique themes. I've got a game here about two, battling two I'm just going to go through the games beside me here just for a second. So I've got a game here about battling two AIs battling each other for world domination. I've got a game about goblins trying to hoard gold. I've got a game based on an ancient Chinese sorcerer trying to destroy the world. Uh, I've got a game about colonization. Okay, there's lots of those. I've got a game about superpower heroes fighting over a city. I got a game about Vikings killing monsters. I got a game about forging steel blades. I've got the Paletti, which is a dexterity game where you're pulling towers out with plastic tools. I don't know. Um, I got a game about the stock market. I got a game about Homeland Security, a game about uh, warring plans. Uh, I don't know what happens in Stratos. You played Stratos with me. I have no idea. Yeah, it's, nope. it's what happens when someone tries to combine Catan with D&D. Um, I have Stronghold, which is a game about a siege. Like there's just so many. And then there's like, well, there's Pooh where you're monkeys who throw poo on each other. Then there's don't step on it, which is a dexterity game where you try to avoid stepping on poo and then shoot the poop where you flush a toilet a number of times, rolled on a die and then poop shoots up and you catch it. And then there's coconuts where monkeys toss little brown balls over their heads trying to get, okay, wait, okay. Feces isn't that unique a theme. There's lots, lots of, I'm not going to say it. 
games out there. And uh, we'll we'll add that in with uh, games about pimple popping, nose picking, yes. and uh, other bodily functions of which there are far more games than yes. there need to be out there right I, now. I totally agree. I got to say, out of the feces games, Poo is actually quite fun. It's it's a solid card game that uses a D20 to attack, and you can, like, defend and stuff. Just Poo, P-O-O. The rest of them, I, I was more choking around. So seriously, there there really are some great, unique themes out there. Um, there's a game about uh, you're running a clinic, right? A, a, a medical clinic. But one of the things you have to take into account is the parking space for the doctors. And then similar to Troubled Live of Billy Kerr, another very unique one is you play the voices in Rodney Smith's head while he's on trial. So we could probably do an entire episode on our favorite games with unique themes. But I decided this week we'd stick more to mechanics. Now, if that is something you want to hear, let us know and we can toss it in our topic pile. So there are some pretty unique games and a few themes as well, but there was a second part to Roger's question. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any that have gone too far and are too weird to be fun? Okay, I know it has fans. There are people out there, but as soon as I read that part of the question, I thought of Flux. So the big thing in Flux, and it was one of the first games to do this, is the rules change during play. Not only that, the first time you play, you don't even know how to win. You literally throw out two cards, everyone gets a card, and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Yes, I have had a good time playing Flux, but I played games where it ended before I even got to take a turn, and I played a game that went over two hours and we gave up because no one's won yet. I am not a fan of Flux, personally. I think that whole, you don't know what the rules are, you don't even know how to win, we're going to keep changing it, is, is a gimmick and not a good mechanic. Yeah, another game in a similar but even less polished form was We Didn't Playtest This, uh, mm -hmm. which came out a little while ago. And uh, that's sort of what Flux feels like to a lot of people. Yes. And then was that one Mao or something like that, where no one knows the rules and everyone that enters adds a new rule? That's like a cult following thing. I know people that adore that game. Now, another one, uh, Mo at tabletopbellhop.com for your hate mail, would be Gloom. Yeah, unique theme. You're you're playing the Adams family, right? You're playing goth families and you're trying to make them as depressed as possible. Has a really cool unique mechanic. It has these nice thick acetone cards that you can see through. And the way they stack different parts from the card below are going to show through on the top. But I have never had a fun game of Gloom. Note, the times I played it were during tournaments. Gloom is not a good tournament game because mechanically it's just not that interesting. Every time I say this, someone will come out, and I'm sure someone's already typing away at their keyboard right now, saying, but the point of Gloom is to tell a story. There's nowhere in the rules that tells me to tell a story. It is a mechanical card game. Yes, I can tell a story in any game I play and probably have more fun. I don't think being able to tell a cool story redeems Gloom in any way. All right, well, another uh, interesting, possibly, mechanic uh, <laughs> is smell-based games. Yeah. Now, there are actually a couple more of these than I thought, but thankfully, not too many. Uh, but there are games like What's That Smell, Aroma, which we did a review of here on this show, Pop Scent, and The Perfumer. Now, unfortunately, these games, unlike many, can actually cause problems for some mm -hmm. players, uh, with Aroma in particular actually coming with warnings because it was using uh, very oils. powerful essential oil scents. Uh, and you needed to be very careful or you could cause problems for people. Uh, yeah, so, Roma, you had to watch to not get the stuff on your hands. Yeah. Like, uh, and I believe what's that smell, I believe, was the one that was actually gross smells that you were trying oh. to figure out things. It's yeah. Let's let's smell is a game is, is a is a type of or portion of the senses that we don't necessarily need to involve in our games. So if you combined it with the poo, no, 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 not <laughs> at all. No, that, honestly, the aroma was the instant headache in a box game. Just opening the shrink wrap on that, Deanna was having a problem. I couldn't keep it in the same room as her. I, this, I, I, no, like, oh, look, we're going to throw a smell in our game. You know what? It didn't work for Leather Goddess as a Phobos. It doesn't work now. Yep. All right. Next one for me is actually an expansion, not a game. And it's where, in my opinion, Carcassonne jumped the shark um, by firing a meeple over it with a catapult. Carcassonne the catapult. What? Why? You, you have a. 
yes, Carcassonne's light ish, but it's not when you play with people who know how to play. It's actually a nice, meaty, super strategic game with some interesting tactics. And yes, if you remove the farm system, you ruin the game as far as I'm concerned. And if you're not playing cutthroat to try to steal places, you're not playing properly. That's how I play Carcassonne. Throwing in a thing where I put a meeple on a catapult and launch it and where it lands is no, no, not no. Why? Why are you throwing that into a strategic game? That, that's yeah. Deanna, there, put it this way. Deanna doesn't know it exists. We owned it and I played with it and I thought it was so dumb. I got rid of it because it just did not belong in that game. Yeah, this was this was probably someone who was a fan of crossbows and catapults and loved Carcassonne and didn't realize that the two don't need to go together at all. Yeah. Like, I'll admit, Princess and the Dragon was already stretching it for me because it added this random element of a dragon that would go around and eat your meeple. I didn't like that as a strategic player. But no, once, once, oof, catapult with for yep. meeples. <laughs> like, fine, put it in a different game. I'll totally play a game about launching meeples with a catapult. I like dexterity games. Don't put it in my carcassonne. Fair. Next, I have, going back to unique themes, I have no idea what the mechanics are in this particular game, and that is Consentical. This is a two-player card game where one player is playing a human, the other player is playing an alien, and you play through their first sexual encounter. Now, I am not opposed to games with adult themes in any way. Totally for it. Dan and I play date night games. We're into certain types of date night games. But this one is just too far out there for me. Yeah, and see, I actually, I, I, I haven't played this one yet, but I'm actually, I would actually like to, uh, because it is a game about consent uh and it's yeah. a card based game where you're looking you're doing combos and, th and and things with cards in order to to try and get the things things to play out correctly uh and with consent of course consentical mm -hmm. um i'm actually really interest, interested in this one because i think enough. it's a nice way to abstract the concept so it's not as uncomfortable as you know a guy and a girl sitting down on a, a, across from each other and and playing through an actual date uh, that way, you you you've you've added that layer of uh, separation between reality and the people playing that helps make it a little easier to uh, to stomach perhaps than it might otherwise. Totally fair, and I know non couples who play this game, so it's not even like it's that kind of game. So totally fair, just not for me. That like I said, that's just a little too far. Um, now another one I want to mention. We for some reason keeps coming up on our show. Like the last four episodes, I think we mentioned this game. And that is Tales of the Arabian Nights. I don't know. Maybe it's just on my mind lately. We're going to have to. It's it's like, you know, you're craving Pizza Hut. You need to get Pizza Hut and it won't go away until you have Pizza Hut. And Pizza Hut, no, is not the same as craving pizza. And that's not the same as craving Windsor pizza. But anyway, I think I need to play Tales of the Arabian Nights to get it out of my system. But anyway, this stuck out because it's a game that doesn't work. So it's a unique game in the fact that they made a sandbox story driven experience with a massive book and ridiculous like seeds where you like run into a beggar and choose from eight options. And then that's randomized on a table to get the beggar's response. Like you'll never play the same game again. It plays completely different. Every time you get a very Sinbad Shaharazad style story out of it. It's very epic. All of that's going on. You even have a feeling of exploration and going to different parts of the world and your character develops. Um, you can have, all kinds of wonky magic things to happen to you. And it's a great experience, but kind of like some people say about the mind, it's almost not a game. That part of it's great, but they forgot to make it a game. So what they did is they threw in this weird arbitrary system where you're trying to get the 40 points of two different stats and you set your goal of how much of the 40 points are in either stat, but there's very little when you're playing to control which of those two you get. So you're just going to spend the game going, nope, I'm out of balance. Oh, I'm out of balance. Oh, I'm out of balance. And most people that play this game, just like Telestrations, throw that out, play until they're sick of playing. Until like, you know what? We're going to play Tales of the Arabian Nights for four hours tonight because it's good enough. I will happily play Tales of the Arabian Nights for four hours. Even better, you hide your totals. Like there's a way to hide them so the other players don't know what you're looking towards. But I don't know of any way to actually manipulate another players that it matters. It's like, like they came with this amazing system for exploring the world. So now there are two different, well, sorry, not different, two versions of Tales from the Arabian Nights. The original from back um, in the 80s, I want to say, possibly that, that old. Uh, so the original was 1985, 
Mm-hmm. It was then re-implemented by Zedman Games. That's the one. Yeah. In 2009. But interestingly, it's being re-implemented again this year. Oh, wow. As Tales of the Arthurian Knights. See, that was it. Like, why didn't they do more? <laughs> so, now, there is supposedly another game that's a sci-fi version of this. It's Agents of Smurf. But I don't know anything about that one. I don't know if it's sci-fi or modern. But there's a game called Agents of Smirsh that supposedly does this right. But I like the Sinbad theme. I grew up watching the kind of terrible stop-motion Sinbad movies. And Eye of the Tiger. Is it Eye of the Tiger? Because Eye of the Tiger is the Rocky thing. Eye of the Something was my favorite growing up. I don't even remember the name now. <laughs> where, it, where it had a guy in a monkey suit was the prince. And they had to put him into the beam of light. Like, I don't know. I grew up on that. I love it. Well, we can keep an eye out for Tales of the Arthurian Knights coming out this curious. year. I, hopefully they do something to so you can win and end the game. <laughs> Another one I tossed down is Dragon and Flagon. So this one just fails in in as a game again. So concept awesome. You are doing a trap and brawl. Yes, I've done a million of them over the years, but they're always in a role playing game. I've never played a board game where you play a, a tavern brawl. This involves kicking over chairs, shoving tables, pulling the rug out from people, picking up mugs and throwing them. Fantasy races that each have their own asymmetric abilities, but it's a programmed movement game that plays slower than D&D 4E combat. And I think that's all I'll say about that. (laughs) Well, I think while we're talking, briefly talking about uh, in combat, I'm going to mention one that we took off the list, but uh, but theme wise, it's interesting. And that's Bloody Inn. Now, this okay. is a game where you're actually running uh, inns. Everyone is running their own inn, but you have discovered that it's more if, uh, efficient to uh, basically kidnap and kill your patrons and steal all their money. Uh, and the winner is the person who finishes with the most money uh, without being investigated by the police. And there's all sorts of interesting mechanics about if the, the night is is over and you haven't buried all your bodies, you have to pay a grave digger to go and hide <laughs> the body. He's for you. And um, so The Bloody Inn is a 2015 right. intriguing sort of... <laughs> it's a different one. That yeah. is definitely... Uh, similar to it, I'm going to bring up Bring Out Your Dead. You play a grave digger and you're getting the coffins to bury, but you're like a medieval one. And it's actually an area majority game and you have different colored coffins for the different players and you're trying to own the best plots. But like talk about a unique game. It's actually a really good gateway area control game if you're okay with that theme. Yeah. And then recently we played um, Gloomy Graves where you're a monster grave digger in in the middle of a big war and like a world like D&D. And you're the, 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 the sad people responsible for burying all the dragon and skeleton, clearing the Warhammer battlefield after it and burying the dead. Yep. So again, unique theme. Now what I'm going to toss in here is that one making me think of it is games with overlapping cards. The first one I played was Hokkaido, where you have a card with like eight different symbols on it. And you have another card with eight different symbols and you have to overlap at least part of them and you can tuck under and above. So that's another one. I hear Circle the Wagons is a better modern version of that, but that's also a unique one. But that works. So I'm kind of jumping backwards. Yep. Yes. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to call it out. Cause I, I think I, you want to talk about a unique game, at least when it came out cards against humanity, let's get sit down and get a huge marketing team to promote a game. That's all about being as offensive as possible and get people to laugh at terrible jokes that shouldn't be made, but feel like it's okay. Cause they're playing a game and the card it's the game's fault for making me say this horrendous thing. Now, what's now, interesting I, you know, we have talked about, I mean, we've talked about this any number of times, and we always will recommend Apple versus Apple for the, uh, for, for its alternate. For, 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 yes. Yeah. If you want to play this kind of game, go for it. Interestingly, I ran across uh, one article specifically saying, don't waste your time with Apple versus Apple. You're not getting the, the full experience if you're not playing the actual Cards Against Humanity. Now, I will say they have gotten a lot better over the years. They've removed a number of cards. They've done some things to make Cards Against Humanity better. And they are also known for the coming up with the concept of here's a hand can of funny things. There's a funny thing on the table, match them and then vote on who made it the funniest. There are so many spinoffs of that. So I have to give them credit for that. But just the the, the entire point, the, the name of the game, Cards Against Humanity, 
it's just i'll admit i played it the first time i played it i was laughing i was having fun so was everyone else and it wasn't really till after the fact i kind of thinking about what we were laughing about and i'm like boy was that really funny um and part of it was one of the players we were playing with left the game night and that's where it kind of sunk in you're like wow yeah we're just showing our privilege here like like yeah none of this affects me so it's funny but when i actually spend half a second thinking about it i'm like well why are we doing this Let, let's let's go play something better fair enough uh another uh really bizarre theme i ran across for the first time today and that <laughs> is donner dinner party and this is yes the donner family cannibalism game for uh, your standard kind of player elimination deduction game, but with one of the top tasteless themes out there. Yeah, that's up there. Oh, uh, huh. that was, yeah. Now, now I, similar game with not quite as offensive, but still I think it's taken it too far, is lifeboats, where you're mm -hmm. all on lifeboats and you have to vote someone off, which yeah. could be basically the same game with a slightly better theme, but like slightly? Yeah. That was one I did not enjoy playing. That that was one that people were bitter by the end. Like the the least person popular person in the group's going to get thrown off the back of the boat, and that's not really cool. Yep. Um, next, I have one that we reviewed. Um, might get me a little bit of hate, hate mail here, and that's Tower of Madness. Um, you have uh, Smirk and Dagger Games decided to take Kerplunk and make a gamer's game out of it. And they did it using a giant Cthulhu tower with tentacles sticking out of it, which seems really cool. And different colored marbles. And some marbles were madness and some were anger and all these marbles. But then they threw it with this surprisingly good Yahtzee game where you're trying to make sets of different symbols on the dice to advance your character and level up and get points. And the whole problem with this, like it sounds great in theory. And I, I was really ex uh, excited to try this game. I wanted this game. And then I played it and when, what it was is it clicked in that the fun part of the game, which is pulling the tentacles out and watching the marbles fall only happens when you play badly and you're like incentivized to not roll the dice and get points. Cause you just want the tower to go. And it's just <laughs> a really odd, like to me, it's a mishmash. Like it just didn't fit well together. I just think there could have been something done. Uh, it's not an old game, but I kind of want like the Restoration Games version of Tower of Madness, where <laughs> where they did something to make the gameplay better. I don't know how to fix that one. Yeah. Now, I'm going to throw one more on here, unless we come up with something else before we get to the end of the segment. But we've been talking about this for a long time, and that is Tragedy Looper. Um, this is time stories done different with an anime theme. It's a time travel game, one versus many, where that one player is almost a GM. It's It's much more of a GM role. Um, you are moderating as opposed to trying to beat the players, but then there are ways you play to try to stop them too. You, you, you start off, you're like, you know, typical 17 year old anime teenagers out of high school wandering around and something terrible happens and then time resets. Now you start playing again and you can do things like you can go be nice to someone and you put heart counters on them or you can warn, warn someone and then you put worry counters on them or you can tell someone to move or not to move and you can move around the board and see different things happen and you just keep kind of doing that and honestly like the second run probably pretty randomly and then the tragedy happens again and time resets and you keep doing that trying to deduce exactly what you need to do to prevent the tragedy and you just get shots over and over trying to figure it out now the problem is the game is too complicated there are too many moving parts too many little things to track. It's almost impossible to learn. It gives you this tutorial to play through that takes like three hours. And you basically have to do that before playing an actual scenario. So unless you're playing with the same group that's going to get together, you know, two days later to play again. And then two days later after that to play again. I'm sure there are groups out there that managed to internalize Tragedy Looper. But I played it four times now. And I still, there's no way I could teach it tomorrow. There's no way I could play it on either role. Yeah, like this it's is, got a great it's a idea. Three, five, five. This is a three yeah, and a half week game. Yeah, 3.5, it's almost as much as Weather Machine, and it's an anime game about time travel. It just, there's too much going on. It, it, it's such a great idea, and it's so close. I need Tragedy Looper Light, and then maybe I'd like it. And it definitely does have it fa its fans, because even 2023, there's a new expansion coming out for Tragedy wow. Looper. There you go. They said people, I still have it, because Deanna's like, you can't get rid of it until I get to try it. And I'm like, oh, I have to teach that game It's again. been going for 12 years now, and it's still got expansions coming out. Yeah. 
So but I, I personally think they overdid it. They overthought it. It's overworked. I don't know. Didn't work for me. Well, now I got, I got to say there are others. I, I all day I've been racking my brain thinking, I know I've been at public play events when someone's shown up with a game and I'm like, what the heck is this? But I just, I haven't been able to put my finger on night. So I'm wondering if maybe next week I'll be like, excuse me, I get the hiccups. So I need water. Um, we're, I'm going to show up next week with like, no, here's the list of really <laughs> over the top games that didn't work. Right. But for this week, that's it for our discussion of out of the box board games, games doing something unique. Now, what's a game you thought took things out of the box? Let us know about it in the comments below. Yeah, we're sure there are way more oddball games out there, games doing something totally different. Now, before we check into the lobby, just a reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions, just like we answered a question from Roger tonight. You can send us questions by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, firing off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting us up on social media. Welcome to our spoiler-free preview of Once Upon a Line, Butterfly's Breath, from Pert and Thrakus who are collaborating with Lucky Duck Games, who we have a, to thank you for sending us a prototype copy to check out. So be aware that this is a preview and not a review. Once Upon a Line is currently live on Kickstarter. The game is not complete, and what we were sent was a prototype copy that only includes a small portion of the final game. Everything we say tonight is based on this pre-production copy and may change with final release. Also note, this is not a paid preview. We were sent a prototype, and that's it. So Once Upon a Line, Butterfly's Breath, which I'm just going to call Once Upon a Line going forward, is being designed by William Aubert and Dan Thauvenot. It's being published by in France by Perte and Fracas, with an English translation and localization being done by Lucky Duck Games. The Kickstarter for Once Upon a Line, along with multiple expansions, funded in under two hours and is still going strong. The base pledge which includes the core game, one expansion, and a metal scratcher, comes in at €39, Euro, or about $42 US. And the all-in pledge tops $100 US. Now, this unique game is listed as playing one to five players, with core scenarios taking three hours or more. There's also a shorter half-hour or so tutorial and a one-hour prologue. All we received were these introductory, shorter games that we can't comment on how long a full scenario actually takes. takes. The game is listed as ages 14 plus, which seems about right, based on the content we saw in the bit we played through. Now in Once Upon a Line, you are a mystical being that takes control of one or more heroes in a post-apocalyptic future Earth. You walk these heroes through a scenario-based campaign where you items you collect, characters you've discovered, and skills you unlock carry over from one scenario to the next. Now, individual scenarios feature branching paths and multiple player decision points. Now, the truly unique thing about this game is how you play it. You explore this future Earth by scratching off squares on the scenario boards the way you scratch off a lottery ticket, looking for keywords that will allow you to draw cards and advance the story. It's unlike anything I've ever played before. Now, normally, this would be the spot where we tell you to go watch an unboxing video. But we're not doing that here because what we received was clearly stated to be prototype components that would not reflect the final product. Now, in our prototype copy, we got three player trays playing pieces for three heroes, two playable tutorial boards, one playable prologue board, and a bunch of other unplayable boards, a scratch off tool and the instructions. Now, the quality of what we got was a bit of a mixed bag. The player trays worked well. They were well designed. The playing pieces used to plan out your moves were great. The tray for holding cards wasn't the best. And one of our tutorial boards had some kind of production issue where it was almost impossible to scratch off. And in the end, our scratching tool, one end snapped off. Now, we didn't have the metal scratching uh, tool you get no. from the Kickstarter. No, we did not have that. It was just a plastic one. Now, the instruction books were mostly clear, uh, pretty good. They definitely had a translated from French feel, but translated by someone who English is their native language. It wasn't as bad as some other ones we've done in the past, and the rules did make sense. What was a little bit odd was the order the information was presented wasn't quite what you expected. 
And some of the wording was just a little strange. What I'm really hoping for in the production copy, though, something that was definitely missing is an index. Now, remember that all of these components are prototypes, and hopefully the problems we did find aren't issues in the final version of the game. Now, let's move on to how you play this rather bizarre game. So set up first, which involves taking a player board and seating it with straight line pieces in sizes one to five. So there's these straight line pieces that cover up one to five squares on the board. You're also going to place a blue zone marker in the tray that kind of divides where you put your pieces in your action areas. And you're going to have a spot to hold your hero card once you start playing. You then find the board or what they call the grid of destiny for the scenario you're about to start and the cards that match that grid. You stick the cards in the provided card holder and flip the grid of destiny over. Here you will record your name, which is skipped for the tutorial, grab any indicating started cards. Now for the tutorial, this is your first hero and their skill sheet. And do whatever it tells you to do on the bottom of the card. Mm -hmm. Now for both scenarios we played, this involved scratching off a single line on the spelling of the grid, spelling out our first keyword. Now, keywords are indicated by having lines after the first and last letter. When you find one of those, including this first one you're going to reveal, you then go through the cards and find the matching card. You're then going to draw that, flip it over and read it and follow instructions there. Now, these cards are going to contain other keywords that you're then going to go search for on your grid of destiny. After the start of the scenario word is found, any future scratching requires you to use up actions. Each hero can take up to four actions before needing to rest. To take an action, you move pieces from the top of your tray onto where you're going to scratch and then place them into one of the action spots to inspatch while scratching off the matching pattern on the grid of destiny. The basic shapes you start with are all straight lines of various lengths that can be combined for longer words, but you can unlock more interesting shapes like bends and crosses and etc. Now, the cards you've revealed are going to give you hints for where to look. If a word is or isn't connected to the word on the card, for example, or if it runs perpendicular to an, ex an existing word and things like that. Now, some hints, though, are more subtle and are found in the story text instead of just being spelled out there in bold letters. For example, the story may mention that something is found near the rear of the shed. This could indicate that the word you're searching for is off the word shed and most likely off the letter D specifically because it's at the end of the shed. Now, without getting into details of exactly how to scratch things off and what you can and can't do, I will just say that you have to start off an existing word and you always have to scratch off the full shape you used for your action, even if you discovered you are headed in the wrong way or come to the end before you are finished scratching off the shape you defined. This is because in addition to letters that are part of words, you could also run into a variety of symbols, most of them bad, that can make your quest harder. Now, after taking four actions with a hero, you have to rest. You also have the option at any time to rest earlier if you want to get a specific piece back because it's used up once you use it. So you really need that five, for example, you might rest early. Now, when this happens, you scratch off a square on what's called the line of tragedy which is at the top of your board of destiny. This is a timer for the game, and it's going to apply penalties the more you scratch off. Now, most of these will have you swap one of your shapes, your action shapes, for a smaller version. So like the first spot may have you swap your five for a four length one. But some will also lock your action spot so you can take less moves going forward before having to rest. Now, some of the special symbols on the grid of destiny can also cause you to scratch off squares on the line of tragedy, as does moving, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, in addition to the story keywords, you can also discover power words on the grid. These let you level up your character by using letters in the power word to cross off matching letters on your character's talent card. If you manage to cross off an entire word, you get a new blue special action. This could be a new shape, a way to prevent a penalty, or more. Now, sometimes when you draw a card, you enter uh, what the game calls a challenge. Resolve a challenge, you're presented with a riddle, and you have to guess the right word to progress. Now, guessing wrong can cause you to gain dystopian points, which are bad things when you get to scoring, or advance the line of tragedy. 
You can also get up to two clues and may even start with some kind of hint, depending on what you did in the story leading up to that challenge. While revealing words, you will eventually encounter words of a different color. Words of different colors represent different physical locations in the story. After discovering a new color, you must travel in order to start revealing words of that color. Traveling requires you to mark off a square on the line of tragedy. Interestingly, once you've unlocked more heroes, different characters can be in different locations. Now, the game continues with you using your hero's actions to scratch off things on the board based on the clues you have, which will reveal new cards with more clues and progress more of the story until you get to the end. At that point, you'll gain any story rewards, record your progress, and calculate a final score. You get a set of default points based on the scenario difficulty, get bonus points for avoiding hazards while scratching, bonus points for not using clues during a challenge, and then lose points for collecting those evil dystopian points. Except during the tutorial, items you found, heroes you unlocked, along with their talents, carry over to the next scenario. The core game is currently listed as having six chapters after the prologue. Now, I'm always on the lookout for games that do something new. And you gotta admit, Once Upon a Line is doing something totally new. Well, I admit, I have seen single scratch-off things in games before, usually some kind of reward. And we had a whole game that was a battle game where you scratched off hit locations. It was a collectible card game. I've never seen a game where basically the core mechanic is scratching off a board, which is why I actually signed up to do this preview. Not only scratch off, but word find puzzle scratch off as well. Yeah, this isn't a case where you just scratch off all the board to figure out what your reward is, which is, I think, where the real treasure here is, the real uniqueness. Now, what I didn't expect is that we'd only get to check out a very small portion of the game. Due to the fact all we got was two copies of the tutorial and the ability to play a single version of the prelude makes it a little hard to judge the game at this point overall. Now, we've all played what was available to us so far, and while it's interesting, it's hard to really judge how well it will hold up over longer plays. Yeah. Now, added to this is the fact the tutorial, while great at teaching you how to play the game, and specifically how to scratch the grid of destiny, does a terrible job of showcasing the actual fun of this game. If I had just played the tutorial, this would have been a much shorter review. Uh, the game really didn't start to show its charm until we actually sat down as a team and played through the prologue. It's only then that the actual neatness and cleverness of the system actually started to show. I completely agree here. I was pretty much done after the tutorial. As more than introductory, it was almost juvenile. It just didn't sell the game at all while it was induce introducing the concepts and mechanics. Yeah, I would recommend if anyone does pick this off, one player do the tutorial and then just walk the other players how to do it after the fact. I don't recommend making players play through it just to learn the basics. Now, I got to say, this game definitely does stick out as unique once playing it. Like, yeah, the theme's interesting, but it works. It feels very different from every other game I've ever played, and I've played a lot of games. If I had to compare it to other games in my collection that I enjoy, I would rank this closest to puzzle games and escape room in the box style games. Though in this case, every single puzzle is word based, including all kinds of puns and palindromes and uh, a, a literal term, a, a literary term I didn't even recognize that's in this game with what the snaking cow paths or something. This to me scratches off the same itch as those games as you're using, you know, logic and deduction and, and reading things into stories to figure out where to scratch next. Yeah, indeed. As far as board games, it really doesn't have any equivalent I'm familiar with, but there's definitely a feel of both word search and crossword puzzle to it on top of the logic problems. Mm -hmm. Now, what impressed me the most about this is when it clicked in that the story was giving us more hints than we thought. It's very obvious the words to find, the main words, because they're in bold and they're underlined and stuff. And, and Sean was reading them out in a rather amusing voice whenever they show <laughs> up underlined, right? But then we had this, oh, there it is. That's what makes this game tick moment that made me swap from not being all that interested in the game and just finding the words on cards to becoming more invested in what we are doing and having a better time. Exactly. In the tutorial, you're just looking for words 
based on letter possibilities. Oh, I have a word that needs a Q and there's two possible places it could be. Which one yeah. am I going to go to? Where in the actual game, there's so much more nuance to the hints in the text. Mm -hmm. You're going back, rereading things to see if you can narrow down which of a couple of potential locations that word might be in. Yeah, and I definitely had a thing where when I played the tutorial, the game was feeling pretty random because there was two or three spots. And I'm like, well, I guess I guess on one. Whereas pretty much, I'm, I'm sure probably all of them, but it felt like almost everything in the prologue, there was a logical reason to search where it ended up being. I don't think there was that much randomness. It may have been there were none because we didn't catch every single little subtle clue. Now, one thing that did come up playing that I don't think I've ever said about any board game before is this game is messy. While playing, you're going to be doing a lot of scratching off of cards and boards that leaves little rolled up bits of silvery material all over your playing surface. You're going to want to be sure to play this somewhere that you can easily clean up this type of mess. And be very careful not to sneeze while playing. A uh, mistake I made while playing through the tutorial. Um, yeah. Carpet is not your friend with this game. And I expect if you have cats that are allowed mm. up on the table, you might also be in some trouble. Yeah, I don't know how pet friendly the scrapings are either. We did find out they're silicon based, so they should latex. be all right. Yeah, it's, latex, it's, it's, it's a latex, latex paint, basically. Yeah, latex paint. Now, another issue with this game that I can see is it's I, I would say it's not replayable. Now, the Kickstarter list recharge packs is being available. They're there as an add on item. But as far as I can tell, it's not like the word get grids are, are going to change. They're going to be the same. And just because of the nature of this game, I think it's going to take a long time to forget where things are to make something truly replayable. Yeah, for me, the only value in recharge would be resale or regifting. Yeah. Imagine trying to redo a crossword puzzle you've already solved, but just erased all the letters in. Yeah, it just, it wouldn't work. And you'd read the clues and be like, oh yeah, this is the one where this is attached to, oh, the shed, it's in the back of the shed. That's right, it was off the D. Like, you're going to remember those things. Now, what I did like is some of the other non-scratch mechanics in this game. I like the action system. It led to some really interesting decisions. And I like the travel mechanic. Uh, seemed a little weird where you just scratch up a thing and switch the color of your board, and all you're doing is scratching different colored colored um uh, types of words but you know what with two players in the prologue where we had found a fisher while we were doing something else and then we decided to split the party with someone scratching off off fisher while someone else went into the red area is all i'll say um i i wouldn't have thought scratching off different colored words in a a crossword or whatever word find would impart that feel but it felt like we split the party and we're each doing our own thing like, it felt like Sean and I were from apart from each other. Like, I, that's impressive. Like, like the, I don't know. We talk about immersion in games. That gave me a level of immersion I totally didn't expect. But we did notice that due to shared inventory. Yes. While there was a mechanism for splitting the party, anyone could use items regardless of which location they were in. Now, speaking of that immersion, that's what broke it a bit. But just, I, I was just shocked that, like, you're you're scratching off green words. I'm scratching off red and it didn't feel like that's it. We're scratching out different colors. Now, interestingly, this interaction while playing two players was way more fun than I expected. I, I should say three. Deanna was still there, but Deanna was just kind of helping out and taking some pictures. Um, up until that point, I was thinking this is a solo game, especially after tutorials. I'm like, why would you want to play this multiplayer? You're just going to argue over where you scratch off. No, no, scratch off over there. It wasn't until all three of us were playing and we were working together, bouncing ideas off of each other, um, reading out the cards, passing the cards to different people to see if they noticed something you missed. That's when the game it clicked in how good Once Upon a Line is as a multiplayer experience. And I can only guess that the actual chapters of the game are going to make this more of a thing. It's much like escape rooms in that way, where you're bringing a wider brain trust to bear on the problem. Mm -hmm. Different people noticing different things about the clues or le letters on the grid layout and where things may go. Uh, you know, if you've got that one person who's really quick at, you know, being able to spatially place words on a on a blank grid, that's a major bonus. While someone mm -hmm. else may be better at uh, deciphering the clues within the text. Also help someone who's really good at riddles, <laughs> which I am not. So overall. 
While we didn't get to experience nearly as much of Once Upon a Lion as I had hoped, I ended up having fun with the game, though it took a bit to get there. Overall, it was more fun than I thought it would be even when first hearing about it. I ch wanted to check this out because it was something new, not because I actually thought I'd like it, which is possibly not the best reason to check out a game, but I wanted to know what was going on. I was surprised to learn just how well the scratch-off word-find mechanic worked and how rewarding it would be to figure out parts of the puzzle, especially when you did it through something in the story and not just using deduction because there's only one Y or whatever. While we did run into some component issues, what we were playing was a prototype, and I can only hope those are fixed in the production version. Indeed, when it worked, it worked exactly as advertised and made for easy playing. Mm -hmm. If you dig story-driven games and word puzzles, I th think we just tried out the perfect game for you. Like, really, if you dig, like, which way style, you know, choose your own adventure books and word puzzles, you probably want to check this one out. I don't think any other game really matches those two as well as Once Upon a Line does. If you're a role player looking to get into character, this isn't your type of story game. You don't really get the feel that you're playing a character in Once Upon a no. Line at all. While they have a background and you can improve them, they are tools to make word finding parts of the game easier and more interesting. They specifically state that you're actually a, a higher being controlling these characters, not yep. playing as them. Which I guess you could get into role playing them, but no, you don't. I, I, the, the, the characters were actors in the story we were watching is more what it felt like. Now, you're also not going to dig this if you're looking for a fantasy dungeon crawler, dice chuck and beat em up. This is not that type of game. If you are looking for that type of game, check out our RPG in a Box episode where we do talk about those. Now, the group of players who I do think will enjoy this game are the ones that like puzzles and figuring out clues. Fans of games like Chronicles of Crime and the various escape room in a box games like Exit and Unlock or Puzzling Pursuits, which we reviewed just a couple weeks ago. I think people are into that kind of game. The group deduction where Sean mentioned the group think is going to help are going to dig this. If you love scratch tickets, this could be a great board game for you. So do resist the urge to scratch the entire board. That will ruin the game. Now, I personally think my mother-in-law would love this game. Unfortunately, I don't have any way to show it to her to find out for sure. But this seems like the kind of thing that's right up her alley. As for me, I'm not completely sold. I did have fun playing what we played, but I wish we could have gotten to experience at least one full chapter of the game. Or even half of a chapter. I don't know how they do that. Based on how much better the prototype was than the tutorial, I think playing a full chapter could win me over. I still might pick it up. I'm thinking about it because even if just to play with my mother-in-law, because I really do think she'd dig it. Well, that's it for our preview of Once Upon a Line. If this sounds like your kind of game, head over to Kickstarter and give it a back. I also invite you to check out my written review on the blog where I get into a bit more detail and I do share some spoiler-free looks at what we were sent. Welcome to our look at Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, a roll and write set in the Valeria universe. Thank you, Daily Magic Games, for sending us review copies of these new small box Valeria games. Dice Kingdoms of Valeria comes from designer Levi Moat and features artwork from the Miko. It was published in 2022 after a very successful Kickstarter, with retail copies hitting stores now with an MSRP of $30 US. This roll and write game lists for one to four players on the box, but works well with up to five. Games tend to run under an hour, even at the highest player count. Now in Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, you are an Earl managing a small duchy in the time of war. You need to rapidly build up and expand by hiring citizens, building up your duchy, creating a network of roads and clearing the land of monsters in the hope that your duchy is declared the southern capital of Valeria and you are awarded the vaunted title of Duke. You do this through a roll and write system that has your citizens generating resources during a harvest phase, then moving on to an action phase where you will select one of three actions, recruit, build, or slay. For a look at the player sheets, dice, and other components in this Valeria-based roll and write, check out our Dice Kingdoms of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube. Now, honestly, there's not a lot to see here. You get six dice, four standard D6 dice in four colors, and a 2D6 die that looks familiar 
two Card Kingdoms fans. There are also two thick pads of player sheets, some cards, and a statue meeple. Importantly, the cards include reference cards. Great for teaching the game and pointing out where you may be making a mistake. Event cards for solo play and end game scoring statues in two sets. Finally, you have the instructions, which are very clear and well written and use a bigger than usual font, which us old folks appreciated. The overall component here is good to excellent. I really appreciate that they use the same style of D6 dice here as in Card Kingdoms, as the dice are used mechanically the same way. I was a little bit disappointed to see that the color dice didn't have symbols on them, but had pips instead, but really, that's a minor complaint, and if I hadn't played other games in this small box series, wouldn't have even realized could be a problem. Now, while the paper is thick enough to handle pens, pencils, and markers, do be careful as some markers may bleed through, mm -hmm. marking the sheets, or perhaps worse, the table underneath. <laughs> now, with that, let's move on to an overview of play. Each player takes a set of two sheets, grabs some form of marker or marking or pencil to mark up the sheets, do not use Sharpies, and names their duchy. The statue cards are sorted, shuffled, and stacked, day statues on top of night, and six are revealed and placed where everyone can see them. Determine a start player and give them the start player statue meeple. Everyone will have the same number of turns, and this helps you remember who started things off. On a player's turn, they take all six of the dice and roll them, then complete two phases. The first is Harvest. All players take part in this, not just the active player. So everyone's going to be paying attention when this happens. Players citizens activate based on the number on the 2d6 dice, both the individual dice and the total of both dice. For each pip you have filled in under an activated citizen, you're going to mark off a pip in the matching building. Filling in these pips can lead to a chain reaction that has you fill in other pips. But more about that after we describe the second phase. Note, you must activate citizens in numeric order, which could mean that you add a pip to a citizen in the middle of the harvest phase, and that citizen can activate that phase. Mm -hmm. Also, if the dice roll generates nothing for you, you get to fill in one pip in the building of your choice. Now, after all players are done harvesting, the active player then takes one action with the remaining dice. They pick one die, yellow, red, or green, and then take the corresponding action. They also have the option to add the value of the blue die to their chosen die. The yellow die lets you recruit more citizens, which will then get you more out of the harvest phase. You slay monsters with the red dice. There are four different monster tracks on your sheets. You spend a red die and then mark off the four left box of the section corresponding to your roll. When doing this, you also get a one gold reward that you fill in on the gold chart. You will get end game points for every monster group you defeat with a bonus going to the player who slays that group first, but everyone else still getting points if they also defeat the same group. Now the green die has you build by filling out road pips on the overland map, starting with an already filled in area. You can only work on one path per action, and if you hit a domain, one of the buildings on the map, you must stop and forfeit any leftover pips. Claiming domains gives you either an instant recruit action of a specific citizen type, or gives you a way to modify your dice. Now, while filling in pips in either phase, you will end up filling in special spaces that let you take additional actions. Now, normal spaces are black circles. They give you nothing. Gold circles have you fill out the gold chart. Green squares let you build one pip, so filling in a square on the map. Blue meeple have you fill in a spot on your wall, the defenses around your, uh, your castle. Red shields let you slay, but you don't get the bonus gold like you do when spending a red die. The Black Plymouth lets you claim a statue card for end game bonus points, and stars give you immediate points. So filling in a special space could lead you to filling in another special space, which could lead to another. You could slay a monster, which in addition to gold gives you a free build. That build may have you fill in a meeple. That meeple has you fill in a spot on your wall, which may have a shield. That shield lets you slay another monster, this time without getting any gold. And that monster may give you a free citizen. You fill in your free citizen, and your action is done. Now the game continues until any one player fills in the last spot on three of the four buildings on their main sheet. At that point, you finish out the round, and everyone totals up their points. 
You get points for each statue, stars, the domains you reached, and monsters you vanquished. The player with the most points wins. Now, what we just described are the rules for playing with two or more players. Dice Kingdoms also includes a solo mode, which plays a little bit differently. Now, in a solo game, you only have 20 turns, which are tracked by crossing off a tree at the start of each turn. You then harvest as normal, but draw an event if you roll doubles. Events are terrible. They are absolutely horrible, and they usually have you crossing off spots on your sheet so you don't get the reward when you fill them in later. After the harvest phase, you do an action phase as normal, selecting one die and potentially adding the blue die to that one to take one of the three actions. Then you get a second harvest action, except this one, thankfully, can't cause events. Yeah, notice that, a second harvest action. I think that is an often forgotten rule. Now, the game continues until you've taken all 20 turns and you total up your points as normal. Check the re rule book to see how you did. And if your duchy becomes the new southern capital of Valeria, or if you're stripped of your rank and spend the rest of your life in the dungeon. So, what did we think of the first roll and write in the Valeria universe? So, I gotta start with, I guess, a bit of a disclaimer here. I have been a fan of Daily Magic Games and their Valeria system games since first trying out Card Kingdoms of Valeria at Origins the year it came out. And since then, I picked up most of the expansions for Card Kingdoms and quite a few of the other Valeria games. I've also been a fan of the designer Levi Moat's work going back to our review of Horizons. Now, I will say I don't just dig Levi because he made a good game that we enjoy, but also due to how willing he was to talk about the game, take our feedback on, and how he's continued to engage with our content since. Even to this day, Levi often joins us for our live podcast recordings Wednesday nights. Which clearly shows a level of taste and intelligence far beyond his years. <laughs> Now, with those biases in mind, I've got to say, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria is one of the best roll and write games I've played. Now, I think this would stand even if this was the first game I played of Levi's and if I didn't have as much experience with other Daily Magic games, but I can't really confirm that. Now, what I'm really not sure on is if I would love this particular game as much if I didn't love Card Kingdoms of Valeria. Because this one thing this small box Valeria game does that the other two in this new series don't is feel like the original game. I feel perhaps because of its close ties to Card Kingdoms, the two games might actually work to help sell the other in both directions, mm -hmm. both for people who love one of them and for people who might not know the franchise yet and be brought into it by playing this, moving on to acquires others in the th series as a result. Now, while others in the Valeria series are a bit more standalone. Now, the Harvest phase in Dice Kingdoms actually plays identical to the Harvest phase in Card Kingdoms, with all players getting stuff based on a 2d6 roll and using both the values of the individual dice and their sum to generate resources. It's just that in this game, the resources are pips that you're going to fill in on your sheet. In many ways, this is a more compact and tighter version of Card Kingdoms. Something you can play in more places with less setup and game length. Now, another thing that ties this game in well with the Valeria universe is the use of the same icons over multiple games. If you played earlier Valeria games, you know blue means magic, red means battling, gold means, well, gold. Um, the colors and iconography here in Dice Kingdoms Valeria are going to be familiar and thus easy to remember for any existing Valeria fans. This encourages crossplay between games in the franchise, as knowledge of one may make the transition to another that much easier. Now, moving on to the gameplay, Sean already mentioned this a bit. It's very tight and solid, as long as you're playing properly. I will say that because of, uh, I say that because the first three games we played, we played totally wrong. Instead of players choosing one die to take a single action every turn, we are having players use all three dice and the choice being which die to add the magic die to. Well, this actually worked rather well, and the game was fun. The downtime got to be really bad, especially later in the game, and we were starting to notice that the end game finish was turning out the same for every player. Everyone had all the citizens, everyone explored most of the name mains, etc. And also, don't forget to add gold when you spend a red die. We messed that one up as well, which led to another example of Levi being awesome and approachable as we question why the gold path was so long. The summary cards are your friends here. Make sure you check them regularly 
at least until you've had a few plays under your belt. Yeah, don't bury them in with the solo play deck if you don't plan to play solo, because you may forget you even have them. Now, what I think is noteworthy and why I even admit to this is that had we never realized we were playing wrong, I would still be here giving you a positive review. But when the game is played properly, it's even better. Way better. Perhaps not surprisingly, playing correctly makes for a shorter, tighter game with a wider range for potential outcomes. When playing wrong games, uh, when playing wrong, games were starting to drift towards that single solution outcome with everyone yeah. becoming uh, homogenous. Now, with only taking one action per turn, this game zips around the table, especially at two players. Holy cow, is it quick back and forth. The game is quick enough and there are enough statues that you can even play it with five players and it works perfectly fine. Again, this was something the designer suggested when we were interacting online and we tried it out and it worked great. Even while eating and drinking during a night out, five players made for a reasonably quick play with no appreciable downtime that wasn't more to do with the food and drink and conversation than the game. Now, this lack of downtime is improved even more by the Valeria Harvest system, right? The fact that it's one of those games where everyone generates something every time the dice are rolled and it gives you something to do. This is a mechanic that I have grown to love in all games that use it. For those who don't know Valeria, Space Base does something similar with its dice rolls. Now, if I had any complaints about this game, it would be in regards to the player sheets. Uh, these are one-sided and very thin. Now, during the unboxing video, if you've watched, I do note I wish they were two-sided. But once playing the first time, I learned why they're not. When playing Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, if you use markers of any type, you're going to get bleed through. Now, for most markers, this bleed through will just show on the other side and not go through to anything else. But with the wrong markers, say Sharpies, this bleed will go right through the sheets and mark up the surface you're playing on, much to my mother-in-law's chagrin. Yes, we learned this the hard way. Similarly, if you just play solo directly on the stack of sheets, you may ruin more than one with a marker. Another, now, another Oh, sorry. Now, another issue that came up with marking the sheets, there are some symbols you need to still be able to see once they're filled in. So we quickly learned that lighter colored markers are better for still being able to find those scoring stars, for example. Now, my kids are actually obsessed with having different colored marker for each pip type, but I actually don't recommend this as it does slow the game down and what should be a zippy game slows down as you watch children swap markers like crazy. But I will recommend having a special color, at least for the stars that will speed up end game scoring. Our Discord mentioned crayons, and while we haven't tried it, this may actually be the best solution. Again, though, only two colors are needed, one for stars and one for everything else. Now, so far, everyone I played Dice Kingdoms of Valeria with has enjoyed it. And everyone I played the game with wrong thought it was better when we played by the proper rules. Of all of the three new small box Valeria games, which we'll be reviewing all three, so watch for those, um, that just released, this is the one that feels the most like the original Valeria game, the Card Kingdoms of Valeria. And the game length is honestly perfect for deciding to play a couple games in a row. I've played a few times now, both wrong and right, and <laughs> enjoyed it thoroughly all times. While I admit roll and rights aren't generally my thing, I think the connection to Valeria and the familiarity of it helped make this one work for me. Now, before I wrap things up, I do want to mention the solo mode in Dice Kingdom's Valeria. Now, I'm not much of a solo player, but I did give it a shot because I did want to address it during the review here, and it's pretty solid. It is super quick, taking like 10 to 15 minutes to play a full game. The solo rules are simple enough, but I found there was just enough going on that I would lose track of exactly what I'm doing and what steps I've taken and what I hadn't yet. I would lose track of what part of the turn I was in. Now, this was especially true due to the second harvest. I also think in every game I played, I finished at least one round by picking up the dice and starting the next one without marking off a tree, because it's really easy. You finish off your thing, you're like, all right, next turn, roll, let's go, and you get the flow going. Uh, forgetting to mark off those trees means I may have given myself one or two extra turns. What it actually felt like is I needed as a supervisor. I needed someone there watching me to catch me when I screwed things up because I swear I must have. Or I'm really good at the game because I, I, we were the Southern Capital twice. Or at the very least, turn off, remove all the distractions and really focus down. Perhaps the game could be a good excuse for some people to disconnect and get some quiet me time. 
True enough. I will submit with kids and noises and my phone going off and everything else. And you wouldn't think so. You're like, how hard is it to remember whether what phase you're in? But I'm like, wait, I just rolled the dice. I generate did was was that the start of the turn? Or was that the harvest phase? That happened a couple times. Or even just filling out pips. If you get distracted, you're like, you're doing the chain. And you're like, wait, I had two pips in that. Did I fill both in? Or did I stop when I put the guy in the wall and finish the guy in the wall? Anyway, solo mode. It was it was enjoyable for what it was. I, I'm still sure I cheated. If you were a longtime fan of specifically Card Kingdoms of Valeria or enjoy other dice-based resource generation systems, like Sean mentioned Space Base and other Bimachi Koro, there's a few of them out there now, I think you're going to really enjoy Card Kingdoms of Valeria. Now, if you're a longtime Valeria fan in general, not specifically Card Kingdoms, this is a great addition to the series that feels like it fits in well, lore-wise, design-wise, and mechanically. If you dig rolling rights, this is one of the best I played, and I can strongly recommend you check it out whether or not you know anything about Valeria games or Daily Magic or Levi Moat's other games. If you don't tend to like dice games due to a high randomness factor, you still might want to check this out. Of all the dice games I played, this has some of the most ways to mitigate the randomness. Now, this starts off by using a 2d6, which gives you a bell curve for resource generation. The fact that you are selecting one of three dice to take an action, so you've got lots of choices, and the ability to add magic to those dice as well. And then there's the domain powers that let you flip, increment, or decrement the dice. Like of all dice games I've ever played, this one feels like I have the most agency over what I'm actually doing. Personally, I am loving this game, as are my usual gaming group, and I don't expect that to change. Up next for me, though, is going to be checking out the Winter Expansion which gives you two new player sheets to use while playing. Well, that's it for our review of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, a roll and write Valeria game that stays true to the lore and mechanics of its predecessors. What's a roll and write or card version of a game that you enjoy just as much, if not more than the original game it's based on? Let us know in the comments. I also welcome you to check out my written review of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, where I got into more detail about the game and how it's played, and share a bunch of pictures from our recent plays. You can find that at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so far January is rocking uh, gameplay-wise. Like, I'm up to 46 plays this month. Now, I will admit that doesn't co include some multiple plays of Codenames Duet in one night, so maybe it's a little overinflated, but I always log my plays of games like that that way. So right now, I have played more games in January than every other month of 2022 other than one, um, which I hope to beat soon. And this is a trend I hope continues through the year. And I think what we're starting to see, um, like, uh, for one, yeah, the public play events are starting up, but that hasn't even happened in January yet. Um, yeah, there was a birthday party, but I think the big thing is Sean's now local and we're getting together more often the game together. It took some time to get the move, illnesses, sales and holidays out of the way, but we are finally getting there. Yes. So to go with that, the first game to talk about is Weather Machine, which we played with Sean and Deanna and myself. So all three of us, uh, this was something Sean backed on Kickstarter, a, a Christmas gift for the group. Um, it's a heavy Vital Asserta game, and even for a Vital Asserta game, I found it a very rough teach. Um, and that's with Sean also watching videos and like we we did videos, we we checked board game geek, we read rule questions, and it was still a bear to just get through all the different steps. Um, not that this is too unusual, but like Deanna fell asleep while we were trying to teach the game. <laughs> Which happens, but usually only with longer games and games she's less interested in, whereas she was really interested in playing this. Yeah, there's a lot of deep interconnectedness, which makes the game great, but really ratchets up the difficulty. Yeah, and I just uh, it has that thing that I kind of hate in games, but I don't know how to fix it is a lack of onboarding and giving you a decision point right at the beginning. You kind of need to know how everything else works. This isn't really the kind of game where you can be like, you, you start the game off with a market action where you're going to buy the resources you need to take all your future actions. And while you can't know what to buy, it's not like one of those games where like, ah, just buy a couple things and 
mess around. It doesn't work in this game. And and I, I don't think that's necessarily a fault of the game, but it makes for a rough first play. Yeah, you almost shouldn't keep score on the first play. Just learn and experience. Yeah. And then even once you get going, you're buying those resources, right? And you're looking, you're like, okay, I am going to try to fix that kind of weather for whatever reason. I decide that's my job. I'm like, all right, to do that, I need bots of those colors and I need those. Okay, no problem. Okay, so then I need to go buy bots. So I'm going to have to get bots. That's not going to be a problem. Okay, I'm going to need gear. So we can't buy gear. So where do I have to go to get a gear? Okay, I can go over here to get the gear. Okay, so we're going to go over there to get the gear. I need a bot to do that. So I'm going to need two bots because I need a bot there and a bot there and I have a gear. So then I move to the spot and I go to buy the gear. And then I realize, oh, I also needed um, a, a chemical. Oh, shoot. I didn't buy the dang chemical. Oh, well, then I have to go back to the plate. Oh, I can't go there now because I don't have any vouchers left to buy the thing. So now I have to find like it just it was very opaque. Not not to set a goal, but how the various steps required to get there. Yeah, again, it, that, that interconnectedness, it's beefy. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. Like, this is honestly heavy for a Lacerda. And I like Fatal Lacerda's other games. He knows Deluxe, one of my top games of all time. I loved Kanban. I liked, um, a con- not the container, what was that? Panamax. Um, I, I, this, was, this one was a little rough. And the one thing that I'm, I'm really, and I don't know if this is going to change, is the one thing I didn't like that kind of sunk in after we played is I found the end game very unrewarding for whatever reason. Now, it was a frustrating play where I don't think any of us accomplished anything we were really trying to do. So that was part of it. But another part was, is there was no, like, the, the, the theme of the game is you are trying to help the professor fix his machine and, 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 and run experiments to be better to stop, like, the world ending from all this climate problems. But when you end the game, you can't, like, the game ends long before you've solved anything. You, you might have helped one little spot, but probably made things worse. And I just felt like th- that ending was unrewarding and, and, and kind of a downer. I'm like, but I thought we were trying to save the world. Instead, it's I got more points than you and the world's still going to crap. Now, to be fair, we ended the game earlier than it should have. Yes. But on the other hand... It is the fact, I mean, we know that the Teleserta has an environmentalist uh, theme mm-hmm. and, and there is quite possibly the fact that, no, you can't solve all the problems. You can try and make things better, but you might also make things worse. That's just how things go. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I love that. It's, it's the reason I didn't like CO2 second edition versus first edition. So that could be a me thing, but that was the one thing that I, I don't know if it'll change. Now, we did play super uber extreme. Like, we messed up enough different things that, like, it's it's not like, okay, scratch, we didn't play it before. But, yeah, there, there's stuff that will definitely change how we played these. Yeah. Uh, I mean, D and I were thrilled with it. Uh, I would normally never say I'm a heavy gamer, but this game felt good. Even knowing that we were struggling and, you know, that we knew mm-hmm. there were going to be some issues. It was really fun. <laughs> I think Sean will enjoy heavy games. He just doesn't know it yet. It's the life cycle of the board gamer is he's going up that track towards the liking heavy games. Anyway, yeah. more to come on that one. I, I expect we'll all enjoy it with more plays now that we've kind of internalized some of the stuff and while well, we figured out the rules we're playing around. Yeah, a, a couple of things overlooked make for a huge swing in that game. Again, because of the interconnectedness. Uh, next up was my birthday. Uh, uh, since we're a gaming podcast, I'll mention the gaming gifts I got. That was the Invaders from Afar expansion or Scythe, which gives you two more armies to use. And player count up to seven, which whew, that sounds I, I got to try it sometime. And then the Encounters expansion, which is a whole bunch of new um, encounter cards that you mix in the deck where you're finding them. The neat part about that one is they're all from fans. It's like Jamie selected the best ones from fans. And I guess they actually add some new mechanics where you have like hidden things that you reveal later. So that sounds neat. Um, And a couple of Azul promos that I'll do an unbox of and show off at some point. Next, we get into the gaming part of the birthday, which started with Dice Kingdoms of Valeria at Chapter 2, while we enjoyed some good craft beers and great food. Uh, This was the first time playing with the proper rules for many of the players. Uh, Sean, Tori, and Kat at that point. And again, all good. Uh, let see above, like, <laughs> listened earlier in the show. I, obviously, we we're kind of fawning over that game. 
Yeah, almost shockingly fast without feeling like you're missing out on game. Yeah, it really, you finally got back that everyone's involved all the time feel you should get from that style of game, which you didn't when we were playing wrong. Yeah. Now back to at my place, we played a game of Quacks of Quedlinburg with Herb Witches and the new Alchemist expansion. Well, new to me, Alchemist expansion. I think it's still the newest expansion, so I guess we can call it that way. Um, first time using this, took a bit. Um, some bits of the rules, I gotta say, weren't clear. Um, how certain phases worked in the order, and more importantly, the card, excuse me, the card selection at the beginning was not clear until I actually had the components in front of me. And yes, everyone says this, I'm terrible at it, that when reading the rules, you should have the board game components out in front of you. I, I tend to read my rules in my van while waiting for people and then reference them again later, like just before playing. So yes, I know it's something you should do. It's something we've even recommended you do. Yes, I know I'm bad at it, but in this case, like maybe more so than ever, you may want to actually like have the components out where you're reading the rules because they'll make a lot more sense. I was totally baffled on how the cards worked until we finally figured it out while playing. Yeah, this has become very asymmetric now with the uh, the afflictions you can choose from. Yeah. Oh, interestingly, with five players, there were only three different afflictions, so there was some overlap. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to say three player, you could be totally different. What I do like, though, is you pick. Like like one three player game with three afflictions could be everyone playing different affliction, all playing the same. And I thought that was neat that that would actually do it. Now I will say there was a bit of a learning curve here. The different afflictions definitely played differently, and there was a little bit of confusion on how to spend the essence you earned. And even still, I'm not quite clear on how it works because there's basically there's two types of cards where you save up essence and spend it on your turn and other cards where you just get stuff at the end of the round. And I got to say, the next time I teach the game, I might make sure that it's only the one type so everyone gets on the same page and then maybe try the other type. Um, I do dig it. So I got to say, like, uh, Table Hog, like, it just keeps growing. This the, the My pot is overflowing, and it's going to explode if I add another expansion. It's like I've got seven snap bangs on my game table right now, and if I pull just one more... It's not going to fit. And I've got an eight by four gaming table. No, we only use about six by four of it, but still table yeah. hog. It, it's and the big problem, I think, is really keeping track of what ingredients you're using because they're randomized and you're you never know which version of the ingredients you're going to be using. It's nice to be able to read them, except there's so much on the table now. You need to keep reaching across and, and re-grabbing and yeah. rechecking them. Well, because you've got all the different ingredients. You've got the three herb witches and now you've got the three afflictions. Yep. So it's just more cards everyone needs to read. And yes, I'm sure if you play the game enough, you start internalizing some of them. But like there's now six different types of all of the core ingredients. I don't even know if I played with them all and I played this game quite a bit. I have no clue. And then this expansion added in more types of local weed. So even no matter what, we had new stuff out during this game. Yep. Overall, though, I dig it. Um, Alchemist was neat. I love the... Whoever designed the boards in this game and the trompe delay to make it look like an actual table in front of you is amazing. Uh, the new mechanics are interesting. Um, warning, though, the part I don't like is it added gameplay time. There's a whole new phase everyone has to figure out. And depending on what you get, there could be a lot of AP there on what to take or what to spend and what to keep. And five player quacks is already long. That was my one complaint about Herb Witch is that once you get the five, it becomes more of an event game almost throwing this in makes it even longer yeah it, it really did stretch it out um and the fact that there's these two different versions of how to spend e essence uh either mm -hmm. after turn or during turn can really lead to staggered player ending turns yeah uh, in my case i had essence i spent during my turn depending on what i pulled whereas everyone else had essence they spent at the end of their turn so i it was possible that i could keep you know, just keep playing for a little bit longer than mm -hmm. everyone else because I had I got extra bag pulls due to my essence. Meanwhile, you're sitting there doing nothing while we're trying to decide how to spend our essence at the end of the turn, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but I gotta say, the one thing I do like about coax is it never feels long while you're playing. It. It's just when you stop and go, "Wow, we got one <laughs> game in, and Sean's got to go home," right? Like that's where it becomes a problem. So. Sean had to head home. He was heading up to Hamilton the next morning. So we're down to just Tory Cat, Deanna, and I. I broke out Monstrosity, which, man, I had been itching to play this game since first seeing it live streamed. I think it was one of like the Gen Con Spring Spectaculars or one of those. I don't even remember. Uh, fun, good game. I, I still dig it. I, I love the concept that 
one player is looking at a card for 20 seconds, describing a monster. Everyone else is trying to draw it. Fantastic concept for a game that does exactly what you expect it to based on that description. The problem is it is a drawing game that rewards drawing skill. And that sets it apart from a whole bunch of other drawing games. One of the things we like about a bunch of the drawing games I own is that it's not about drawing skill. It's about, you know, conveying ideas. Whereas this is more literally who can draw better at times. And because of that, it didn't go over as well as expected. Now, what I didn't realize, Kat actually gets stressed out by this type of game we're drawing, where she does say, play Telestrations. And she said out loud, she's like, well, I dig this, but I'd rather play Telestrations. And honestly, I kind of feel the same. I think I'd, in most cases, rather play the silly laugh out loud Telestrations rather than this. This didn't have the, the my side hurts by the end of the night that I get from some other games. Yeah, it, it's tough when there's artistic skill involved. Um, because a lot of the games, like Telestrations, you do not need artistic skill. No. Uh, boxes and stick figures are it. Whereas this game, you are trying to convey a description being given to you. And you know, again, artistic skill matters. Yeah. The other thing, too, that was a bit of a problem with this game is it was a party and we kind of wanted to hang out and chat. And this was not a hangout and chat game. But that's not a problem with the game. That's just a problem in me. Let's play this silly drawing game, not really thinking about the fact that it's going to have everyone burying their heads and their their notepads or whatever. Now, another thing I do want to bring up, because Sean's now seen the cards as well that I mentioned the first time we played this game, is I am I, I like the art, but I don't like how I, adults, not the right word, but like just kind of disturbing over the top, um, sometimes like violent, but there's no violence, but like bladed weapons and claws and slobbering teeth and creepy alien things going on. And if you have any phobia for any type of animal that might be mashed with another animal, you don't want to play this game. Uh, old man, Logan, if you're listening, you don't want to play this game. Interestingly, uh, the community on BGG says six, the game is listed for eight. And I think six is a little young for some of these monsters. Yeah. I would not no. maybe, I mean, no, they could draw something you were describing, but I would not want to be showing kids who are six years old these cards. No, I or agree. Some, like or some that. of them anyway. Yeah. I, my kids are older. They're in their teens, and they were disturbed by some of the artwork. So now that said, there is a cute, funny, happy version that we may pick up. But Sean has now seen the cards, and he agreed, at least on some of these, they're a bit much. Yeah. So realizing we wanted things with more interaction and the fact I had a bunch of crap beers and I failed totally at doing that, I grabbed Ven thinking, hey, it's a party game. Yeah, again, you, you don't talk while you're playing Ven. Well, you do, but you talk about the clues you're guessing and you don't interact with each other. Uh, so another fail on my part, I guess I, I should, Deanna suggested I make a list before the night and possibly make a D6 table or something. I probably should have. Anyway, Ven's still fun. Um, we played team-based, uh, Deanna and I versus Torian Cats. We played couples. Game's still neat. I, I dig that game. The more I play it, the more I'm, I'm, I'm starting to enjoy it even more. Um, what I thought was really funny is Torian and Cats team were playing a very different game than us. They were only using the outer circles, not necessarily intentionally. And what they were doing was throwing down a card whenever it was even tangentially re uh, similar to the word. Like this has brown in it and the word's brown and they would just keep piling these huge piles of cards until their partner figured out what was the commonality between those cards. And I'm like, I don't even know if that's how you're supposed to play because it's kind of metagaming it, but there's nothing in the rules that's against that. And I'm like, we got to play the hard variant where your first card has to be one of the inner circles because they're obviously avoiding that. And at one point I mentioned it and Tori's like, oh, I totally forgot you could play in the inner circle. So he was basically playing not Ven. He was playing name <laughs> three words with cards. Um, I don't know. It seemed to work well enough for them at first, but then Deanna and I did end up taking the win, but it was a close game. But it was just weird to see them playing so different, where I often put out a middle first, or I would get one and then branch out from it instead of just old, oh, there's an old guy in this. Oh, there's something rusted. Oh, there's this. And there, there's I, whatever, you know, there's the sky. The sky is ancient, so it's old. And just like throwing these piles of cards was strange and so for next party we're going to be setting up uh the crew the mind yeah. i think uh, the mind yeah the, you know, the mind definitely uh, hanabi we'll get you a copy of hanabi next time i have too. hanabi i there actually have hanabi i own it <laughs> yeah well, i don't know so then deanna pointed out again okay look 
the, the we want to play a game where we can chat we're getting a either we play no games we hang out and chat or you pick a game we can play so i grabbed uh thrones of valeria which all of us are so familiar with trick taking and chatting while playing trick taking games that actually weren't great uh this first play for tori um which was tori picked it up if again if you you grew up in this area and you played euchre you're going to get this game especially if you're also a gamer it's going to help you're going to be familiar with different character powers and stuff like that now, unlike our review earlier, this one has no tie to the Valeria except for the name, but it's a really, really good trick-taking game. And for more about it, just listen to our last episode. Great game. Trick-taking. Fantastic. If you like trick-taking, buy it. Yep. Next, Tori and Kat had to head home. It was getting late. D and I were still good to go, or at least I was good to go, and D was willing to put up with me. So we broke out our copy of Racco, which honestly I still think is the best play a game while hanging out and chatting because you barely have to pay attention. You do have to pay attention, but barely. Um, we tried the two player variant, which I got to say is an improvement. Um, what it led to was not as much of a runaway leader problem and games were much closer because the goal at this point is you can't call Racco until you have a straight of at least three. And what I found that meant is most people's racks were nearly in order before getting that. So your scores, even when you lost, tended to be up in the like 35 plus range instead of getting 10 when someone else is getting 75. Right. And while with the straight, you you were card counting like you had to pay attention. If you had 36 and 38, you were paying attention to see if that 37 gets played. Right. So I did. I like that way better. Um, The other thing we tried was the bonus points, which I have no idea if that's supposed to be combined with two player. I don't think it is because technically one of the sets of bonus points was for a run of three and we just ignored that one. We went for if you get a four or five or six. And the only problem with that was one good run and the game is over. Like, I think I got a 450 point run because <laughs> I got five and it's like you played a 500, which I don't know, kind of felt good. Like, look, I got a five run and I win. And it didn't mean the game didn't go on too long, which is a problem with Racco. But I don't know about that scoring method. Uh, interestingly, this weekend, I actually got some, some game time with the kids. Uh, I got to play uh, the game that sh- uh, from the author shall not be mentioned, uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, which my kids love. Uh, and we discovered uh, an extreme uh, aspect that we have possibly been playing the entire time wow. we have been playing this game. Uh, and it's just a simple little timing issue. Uh, it's 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 in the flow of a turn when something happens um we still didn't win but we actually got several more turns in the game than we mm. would have had we not caught this uh, error so uh we, so we can you describe the error for anyone else to see if they're making the same yeah absolutely so what it is it's when the location is lost um uh so when when the um when your location is lost we had been basically triggering it then when the location isn't fully lost until the after the at the very end of your turn so any other opportunities that arise during your turn to remove some of the location markers okay. can actually save you from losing mm-hmm. that location and it, it doesn't come up all the time it's it's actually kind of rare that that would happen but it had specifically happened during this game and I, all mm-hmm. of a sudden it was like wait a second hold on let me check something. And I pulled open the rule book and I flipped and flipped and checked. And sure enough, it was there and that the timing was there in the rule book. And we didn't lose that first location as early in the game as right. we would have okay. otherwise. I have no clue if I played that right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's been too long since I played the game. Fair. Uh, next for me was Sunday at the in laws. Uh, this was more birthday celebration. Excuse me. More birthday celebrations. Don't mix the water with the coffee, seems to be the problem. <laughs> If once I switch to coffee, I stick to coffee. I apologize. Um, so we're moving on to Sunday at the in-laws. A uh, couple more gaming gifts. Azul Queen's Garden, which I already have three different friends asking me for opinions on. People want me to bring it Saturday. That's probably not going to happen. A promo for it. And one of the coolest gifts ever. Uh, my daughter made me a custom board for Quad Heroes, which I would love to show off, but it still needs a bit more work. Um, and it's still over at Brenda's to be worked on. She has spent many hours on this. It's a four segment board with four different elements represented on it. So my daughter made me a custom board, which is pretty cool. Uh, so joining the love of art and gaming together. Yes. 
Kevin, I'm sure, is, would be excited to see that one, and I'll share it with Ryan, or he can share it with Ryan since he knows Ryan better than I do. Um, while there, we also played Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. Again, this is the first time playing with the proper rules uh, with that group, and again, everyone enjoyed it, and I, everyone did the usual, wow, it's even better with proper rules, and everyone said, well, I already liked it before, which seems to be the common thing that's happening. Though they said, it was getting to that point where I'm like, after the fourth play, I was like, you know, this, there's a part of this that I'm worried about. Well, that's all gone. So, yeah, everyone was already enjoying it. So that worked. Um, then more Dice Kingdoms. You could tell we reviewed this one this week. We did way more than five plays of this one. Um, I gave the game a shot solo, um, something I'd planned to live stream, um, but didn't work in because it ends up the we wanted to rush the Once Upon a Line review and we had to have Sean come over and setting up my cameras. and It just didn't fit in. I wish I'd live streamed it though. So people in the chat could have been like, Hey, you didn't mark off a tree. Cause the first game I quit with three spots left and scored 83. Cause I'm like, there's no way. Like I literally, everything's filled in all four buildings, all the citizens. There's no way I did this right. So then I played a second time and I still scored over 80. And I don't, again, I, I just feel like at least once I missed crossing off a tree and I took at least one extra turn. I don't know. Maybe I'm good at the game. Maybe I I I am tend to be good at these role for resource generations because I understand the probabilities of the numbers. And if the dice play along with proper bell curves, I tend to do well in them. That's it's why I often win space pace, but not all the time. Maybe that's all it is, but maybe I cheated fairly because <laughs> I totally missed it. Then the last game of this past week, Once Upon a Line. Uh, we already talked about this tonight, but it was a crunch play it session because uh, unfortunately... I wasn't, I knew the Kickstarter was going live in January. I didn't know the exact date and unfortunately learned about it by a Facebook post saying, Hey, come back to this. And I'm like, Oh, that's not good. We have that to re preview. Sorry, not review preview. I need to do that. So I sat down and I tried to play it solo and it was a horrible experience. And I almost just put the box away and did nothing with it. Thinking, you know, not saying anything at all is better than saying something bad about the game, but it ends up. One of the tutorial boards they sent me was printed wrong, got hot, got humid. They used the wrong glue. I have no idea, but it was almost impossible to scratch off. I will admit this arm right back here and here is sore today. And my entire desk and floor were covered in silver bits trying to scratch that card off. And I'm like, I don't care how good the game is at this point. This is unplayable. No one is going to want to go through the work doing this, and I'm using their special scratching tool. But being a, a good content creator that I am, I'm like, you know what? I got it. I have to copy of the tutorial and have the prologue. Let's either get D to do it or Sean to do it, and then we'll all play the prologue together, or two of us will play the prologue, and we worked it out, and it ended up all three of us were free, so Deanna could take pictures while Sean and I played, and I am so glad we did. And they should be so glad we did, because like I said, I was in the throw it out in the bot garbage level of review for a bit there. And I don't know what happened. Like, like I watched Sean scratch off the first thing and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't and just I my technique because I tried it. I tried the board that he had the problems with and I had the exact same problem. It was yeah. there was a manufacturing error in that in that grid yeah. of destiny. The, the like graphics would rub off, but the silver stayed whatever. Yeah. They didn't bond to each other or something. Yeah. And even the amount of schmutz created was way less when we played the actual game. Like, like I shared pictures on Twitter that I would feel guilty about, but honestly, that was the game I had at the time. So it's, it's not like I'm lying about the mess it made. It made a mess. Yeah. And I did sneeze at one point, which was bad. <laughs> All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So you're heading over Friday. Sean's heading over Friday. We're still debating if we give Weather Machine another shot or work on the pile of obligation. I will admit we are leaning towards pile of obligation right now just because of the number of things in there. Maybe we can fit in weather machine, but Deanna's is kind of on my side here going, yes, we should play it again. Well, the, you know, we still remember things, but it's not obligation. And we have other stuff that we've had for quite a while. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm hoping for a bit of both uh, as weather machine is hard enough to grasp the longer between plays, the less we're going to recall, but I do understand we have, we have content uh, to create. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe we save it for Sunday or for free or something else just to try to get some stuff in. So as for the pile of obligation, I want to get Smash Up Disney out, uh, hopefully next week. At this point, I think I played it four times. It might be five. It, it needs like one, two more plays max, and we're good to go. So I want to do that. 
But then I have Dolce, which we played once at this point. So that's going to need some some more plays in there, maybe even two in one night at least. It's still going to take a bit before we get to the review, but we need to work on that one. Um, if D's busy, like if she has to, like, whatever, deal with my mom or the kids or is cooking us dinner or something, maybe you and I can play through a game of Disney Epic Duels so we can get that one going. Um, at some point, we need to get Horizon Zero Dawn back to the table. Like there's just... A bunch of games we played a couple times that were just not quite at that ready to review point that I think we need to push over the edge before I start playing my own games. Yeah, it's uh, it, w- it would be nice to be one of those reviewers who just uh, played the game once and went, yeah, that's great. OK, let's move it on. Uh, but we don't do that. And uh, that means uh, a lot of time is invested in playing these games to give an honest review. And the problem is none of these are really things I want to bring to the barbershop bar. They're not that atmosphere was mostly casual gamers, people checking out the night for the first time. Yeah, there was one table playing a little heavier games, and I'm sure Deanna will want to play a heavier game. But I nothing on the list of obligation I think really fits. I again maybe smash up Disney. Maybe I'll bring that one. So so that does lead me to the next thing is Saturday. I'm co-hosting an open game night at the barbershop bar. Uh, this is our second event there. And it'll be my second in-person event since the initial COVID re- lockdowns and my first uh, public play event of 2023. Um, now, what I do plan on bringing is Drop It, Monstrosity, and Thrones of Valeria. I think all three of those are going to go over really well. I think that this will finally be the right crowd for Monstrosity, but we'll see. And then, well, if I can think of any of the obligation games that'll fit, again, Smash Up Disney might work. That might be a good one for that group. Well, I wish it played more players, though I think it'd be way too slow if it played more players. But like, I, it feels like it should be a six player game, but I guess we're stuck with four. And then, like I said, I'm sure Deanna will pack something a little heavier, and I'm sure there'll be people there to play heavier games as well. This will be my first public gaming event since Gorinto was still a prototype. Yes. Now, along with this, due to uh, birthday gifts, I'm going to need to sit down and do some more unboxings. Um, I really want to dig into the new Azul, as do other people want me to dig into the new Azul. Um, But I also have some obligation stuff we haven't gotten out of the box yet, too. Like, uh, you can still see the Thunderbird behind me and some other stuff. Um, So there is that to get to as well. I'm hoping maybe I can pick a day to get some of it done, if nothing else, just to get Azul open so we can try it. Because... So far, we have enjoyed every Azul game. Always more content. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. Why am I reading your part? I don't know. The the Misdirected Mark podcast, a podcast to catch up on along with many others. Uh, Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Ducas, thank you. Evil John, we managed to find some pecan coffee, but it's not as good as quite what you sent us. It's still pretty good, though. Thank you, John. Well, that was the double bell. Yeah, I'm obviously burnt out, and I've reached the end. Like we hit midnight, the the pump, the the pump to, pumpkins turned into a coach, and <laughs> the the horses have turned into mice, and all all that stuff. Yes, I know that's backwards, but it's time to go home. I'm, my shift's done. Bye. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Now, if you do dig what we've been doing, and uh, it would be awesome if you went to Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and tipped your bellhop, as I laugh about the irony of my unprofessionalism at the end of the show where I ask for tips. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for the Penthouse Suite After Show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. Oh, you're not going to call it out. Sean has something to unbox, so stick around. I do, yes. I thought you'd throw it in there. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.